Chapter thirty six of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six The Carnival at Rome. When Franz recovered his senses, he saw Albert drinking a glass of water, of which, to judge from his pallor, he stood in great need, and the Count, who was assuming his masquerade costume. He glanced mechanically towards the square. The scene was wholly changed. Scaffold, executioners, victims, all had disappeared. Only the people remained full of noise and excitement. The bell of Monte Cittorio, which only sounds on the Pope's decease, and the opening of the carnival, was ringing a joyous peal. "'Well,' asked he of the Count, "'what has then happened?' "'Nothing,' replied the Count only as you see the carnival has commenced make haste and dress yourself in fact said franz this horrible scene has passed away like a dream it is but a dream a nightmare that has disturbed you yes that i have suffered but the culprit this is a dream also only he has remained asleep while you have awakened and who knows which of you is the most fortunate but peppino what has become of him peppino is a lad of sense who unlike most men who are happy in proportion as they are noticed was delighted to see that the general attention was directed towards his companion he profited by this distraction to slip away among the crowd without even thanking the worthy priests who accompanied him decidedly man is an ungrateful and egotistical animal but dress yourself see monsieur de morcerf sets you the example albert was drawing on the satin pantaloon over his black trousers and varnished boots well albert said franz do you feel much inclined to join the revels come answer frankly ma foi no returned albert but i am really glad to have seen such a sight and i understand what the count said that when you have once habituated yourself to a similar spectacle it is the only one that causes you any emotion without reflecting that this is the only moment in which you can study character said the count on the steps of the scaffold death tears off the mask that has been worn through life and the real visage is disclosed it must be allowed that andrea was not very handsome the hideous scoundrel come dress yourselves gentlemen dress yourselves franz felt it would be ridiculous not to follow his two companions example he assumed his costume and fastened on the mask that scarcely equalled the pallor of his own face their toilet finished they descended the carriage awaited them at the door filled with sweetmeats and bouquets they fell into the line of carriages it is difficult to form an idea of the perfect change that had taken place instead of the spectacle of gloomy and silent death the piazza del popolo presented a spectacle of gay and noisy mirth and revelry a crowd of masks flowed in from all sides emerging from the doors descending from the windows from every street and every corner drove carriages filled with clowns harlequins dominoes mummers pantomimists transteverins knights and peasants screaming fighting gesticulating throwing eggs filled with flour confetti nosegays attacking with their sarcasms and their missiles friends and foes companions and strangers indiscriminately and no one took offence or did anything but laugh france and albert were like men who to drive away a violent sorrow have recourse to wine and who as they drink and become intoxicated feel a thick veil drawn between the past and the present they saw or rather continued to see the image of what they had witnessed but little by little the general vertigo seized them and they felt themselves obliged to take part in the noise and confusion a handful of confetti that came from a neighboring carriage and which while it covered morcerf and his two companions with dust pricked his neck and that portion of his face uncovered by his mask like a hundred pins 
incited him to join in the general combat in which all the masks around him were engaged he rose in his turn and seizing handfuls of confetti and sweetmeats with which the carriage was filled cast them with all the force and skill he was master of the strife had fairly begun and the recollection of what they had seen half an hour before was gradually effaced from the young men's minds so much were they occupied by the gay and glittering procession they now beheld as for the count of monte cristo he had never for an instant shown any appearance of having been moved imagine the large and splendid corso bordered from one end to the other with lofty palaces with their balconies hung with carpets and their windows with flags at these balconies are three hundred thousand spectators romans italians strangers from all parts of the world the united aristocracy of birth wealth and genius lovely women yielding to the influence of the scene bend over their balconies or lean from their windows and shower down confetti which are returned by bouquets the air seems darkened with the falling confetti and flying flowers in the streets the lively crowd is dressed in the most fantastic costumes gigantic cabbages walk gravely about buffaloes heads bellow from men's shoulders dogs walk on their hind legs in the midst of all this a mask is lifted and as in callos and temptation of st anthony a lovely face is exhibited which we would fain follow but from which we are separated by troops of fiends this will give a faint idea of the carnival at rome at second turn the count stopped the carriage and requested permission to withdraw leaving the vehicle at their disposal france looked up they were opposite the rospoli palace at the center window the one hung with white damask with a red cross was a blue domino beneath which france's imagination easily pictured the beautiful greek of the argentina gentlemen said the count springing out when you are tired of being actors and wish to become spectators of this scene you know you have a places at my windows in the meantime dispose of my coachman my carriage and my servants we've forgotten to mention that the count's coachman was attired in a bearskin exactly resembling audrey's in the bear and the pasha and the two footmen behind were dressed up as green monkeys with spring masks with which they made grimaces at everyone who passed franz thanked the count for his attention as for albert he was busily occupied throwing bouquets at a carriage full of roman peasants that was passing near him unfortunately for him the line of carriages moved on again and while he descended the piazza del popolo the other ascended towards the palazzo di venezia ah my dear fellow said he to france he did not see what there that calash filled with roman peasants no well i am convinced they are all charming women how unfortunate that you were masked albert said franz here was an opportunity of making up for past disappointments oh replied he half laughing i hope the carnival will not pass without some amends in one shape or another but in spite of albert's hope the day passed unmarked by any incident excepting two or three encounters with the carriage full of roman peasants at one of these encounters accidentally or purposely albert's mask fell off he instantly rose and cast the remainder of the bouquets into the carriage doubtless one of the charming females albert had detected beneath their coquettish disguise was touched by his gallantry for as the carriage of the two friends passed her she threw a bunch of violets albert sees it and as france had no reason to suppose it was meant for him he suffered albert to retain it albert placed it in his buttonhole and the carriage went triumphantly on well said france to him there is the beginning of an adventure laugh if you please i really think so so i will not abandon this bouquet pardieu returned france laughing <laughs> in token of your ingratitude the jest however soon appeared to become earnest 
for when albert and france again encountered the carriage with the contadini the one who had thrown the violets to albert clapped her hands when she beheld them in his buttonhole bravo bravo said france things go wonderfully shall i leave you perhaps you should prefer being alone no replied he i will not be caught like a fool at a first disclosure by a rendezvous under the clock as they say at the opera balls if the fair peasant wishes to carry matters any further we shall find her or rather she will find us to-morrow then she will give me some sign or other and i shall know what i have to do on my word said franz you are wise as nestor and prudent as ulysses and your fair circe must be very skilful or very powerful if she succeed in changing you into a beast of any kind albert was right the fair unknown had resolved doubtless to carry the intrigue no farther for although the young men made several more turns they did not again see the calash which had turned up one of the neighboring streets then they returned to the rospoli palace but the count and the blue domino had also disappeared the two windows hung with yellow damask were still occupied by the persons whom the count had invited at this moment the same bell that had proclaimed the beginning of the mascherata sounded the retreat the file on the corso broke the line and in a second all the carriages had disappeared franz and albert were opposite the via della marata the coachman without saying a word drove up passed along the piazza di spagni and the rospoli palace and stopped at the door of the hotel signor pastrini came to the door to receive his guests franz hastened to inquire after the count and to express regret that he had not returned in sufficient time but pastrini reassured him by saying that the count of monte cristo had ordered a second carriage for himself and that it had gone at four o'clock to fetch him from the rospoli palace the count had moreover charged him to offer the two friends the key of his box at the argentina franz questioned albert as to his intentions but albert had great projects to put into execution before going to the theatre and instead of making any answer he inquired if signor pastrini could procure him a tailor a tailor said the host and for what to make us between now and uh, to-morrow two roman peasant costumes returned albert the host shook his head to make you two costumes between now and to-morrow i ask your excellency's pardon but this is quite a french demand for the next week you will not find a single tailor who would content to sew six buttons on a waistcoat if you paid him a crown a piece for each button then i must give up the idea no we have them ready made leave all to me and to-morrow when you awake you shall find a collection of costumes with which you will be satisfied my dear albert said franz leave all to our host he has already proved himself full of resources let us dine quietly and afterwards go and see the algerian captive agreed returned albert but remember signor pastrini that both my friend and myself attached the greatest importance to having to-morrow the costumes we have asked for the host again assured them they might rely on him and that their wishes should be attended to upon which france and albert mounted to their apartments and proceeded to disencumber themselves of their costumes albert as he took off his dress carefully preserved the bunch of violets it was his token reserved for the morrow the two friends sat down to table but they could not refrain from remarking the difference between the count of monte cristo's table and that of signor pastrini truth compelled franz in spite of the dislike he seemed to have taken to the count to confess that the advantage was not on pastrini's side during dessert the servant inquired at what time they wished for the carriage albert and franz looked at each other fearing really to abuse the count's kindness the servant understood them his excellency the count of monte cristo had he said given positive orders that the carriage was to remain at their lordship's orders all day and they could therefore dispose of it 
without fear of indiscretion. They resolved to profit by the Count's courtesy, and ordered the horses to be harnessed, while they substituted evening dress for that which they had on, and which was somewhat the worse for the numerous combats they had sustained. This precaution taken, they went to the theatre, and installed themselves in the Count's box. During the first act, the Countess G. entered. Her first look was at the box where she had seen the Count the previous evening, so that she perceived Franz and Albert in the place of the very person concerning whom she had expressed so strange an opinion to Franz. Her opera glass was so fixedly directed towards them, that Franz saw it would be cruel not to satisfy her curiosity, and, availing himself of one of the privileges of the spectators of the Italian theatres, who use their boxes to hold receptions, the two friends went to pay their respects to the Countess. Scarcely had they entered, when she motioned to Franz to assume the seat of honour. Albert, in his turn, sat behind. "'Well,' said she, hardly giving Franz time to sit down, "'it seems that you have nothing better to do than to make the acquaintance of this new Lord Ruthven, and you are already the best friends in the world.' "'Without being so far advanced as that, my dear Countess,' returned Franz, "'I cannot deny that we have abused his good nature all day.' "'All day?' "'Yes. This morning we breakfasted with him. We rode in his carriage all day, and now we have taken possession of his box.' "'You know him, then?' "'Yes and no.' "'How so?' "'It is a longer story. Tell it to me.' "'It would frighten you too much.' "'So much the more reason.' "'At least wait until the story has a conclusion.' "'Very well. I prefer complete histories. "'But tell me how you made his acquaintance. "'Did anyone introduce you to him?' "'No, it was he who introduced himself to us.' "'When?' "'Last night after we left you.' "'Through what medium?' the very prosaic one of our landlord. He is staying, then, at the Hotel de Londres with you? Not only in the same hotel, but on the same floor. What is his name? For, of course, you know. The Count of Monte Cristo. That is not a family name. No, it is the name of the island he has purchased. And he is a count? "'A Tuscan Count.' "'Well, we must put up with that,' said the Countess, who was herself from one of the oldest Venetian families. Oh, "'What sort of man is he?' "'Ask the Vicomte de Morcerf.' "'You hear, Monsieur de Morcerf, I am referred to you,' said the Countess. "'We should be very hard to please, madame,' returned Albert. "'Did we not uh, think him delightful?' A friend of ten years' standing could not have done more for us, or with a more perfect courtesy. Come, observed the countess, smiling, I see my vampire is only some millionaire who has taken the appearance of Lara in order to avoid being confounded with Monsieur de Rothschild, and you have seen her. Her? The beautiful Greek of yesterday. No, we heard, I think, the sound of her guzla but she remained perfectly invisible. "'When you say invisible,' interrupted Albert, "'it is only to keep up the mystery. For whom do you take the blue domino at the window with the white curtains?' "'Where was this a window with white hangings?' asked the Countess. "'At the Rospoli Palace.' "'The Count had three windows at the Rospoli Palace?' "'Yes. Did you pass through the Corso?' "'Yes.' "'Well, did you notice two windows hung with yellow damask, "'and one with white damask with a red cross? "'Those were the Count's windows.' "'Why, he must be a nabob. "'Do you know what those three windows were worth?' Two or three hundred Roman crowns?' Two or three a thousand? "'The deuce! "'Does his island produce him such a revenue? "'It does not bring him a bayoko. "'Then why did he purchase it?' "'For a whim.' "'He is an original, then.' "'In reality,' 
observed Albert. He seemed to be uh, somewhat eccentric. Were he at Paris and a frequenter of the theatres, I should say he was a poor devil, literally mad. This morning he made two or three exits worthy of Didier or Antony. At this moment a fresh visitor entered, and, according to custom, France gave up his seat to him. This circumstance had, moreover, the effect of changing the conversation. An hour afterwards the two friends returned to their hotel. Signor Pastrini had already set about procuring their disguises for the morrow, and he assured them that they would be perfectly satisfied. The next morning, at nine o'clock, he entered Francis's room, followed by a tailor, who had eight or ten Roman peasant costumes on his arm. They selected two exactly alike, and charged the tailor to sew on each of their hats about twenty yards of ribbon, and to procure them two of the long silk sashes of different colours with which the lower orders decorate themselves on fete days. Albert was impatient to see how he looked in his new dress, a jacket and breeches of blue velvet, silk stockings with clocks, shoes with buckles, and a silk waistcoat. This picturesque attire set him off to great advantage, and when he had bound the scarf around his waist, and when his hat placed coquettishly on one side, and let fall on his shoulders a stream of ribbons, France was forced to confess that costume has much to do with the physical superiority we accord to certain nations. The Turks used to be so picturesque with their long and flowing robes, but are they now not hideous with their blue frocks buttoned up to the chin, and their red caps which make them look like a bottle of wine with a red seal? France complimented Albert, who looked at himself in the glass with an unequivocal smile of satisfaction. They were thus engaged when the Count of Monte Cristo entered. Gentlemen, said he, although a companion is agreeable, perfect freedom is sometimes still more agreeable. I come to say that today, and for the remainder of the carnival, I leave the carriage entirely at your disposal. The host will tell you I have three or four more, so that you will not inconvenience me in any way. Make use of it, I pray, for your pleasure or your business. The young men wished to decline, but they could find no good reason for refusing an offer which was so agreeable to them. The Count of Monte Cristo remained a quarter of an hour with them, conversing on all subjects with the greatest ease. He was, as we have already said, perfectly well acquainted with the literature of all countries. A glance at the walls of his salon proved to France and Albert that he was a connoisseur of pictures. A few words he let fall showed them that he was no stranger to the sciences, and he seemed much occupied with chemistry. The two friends did not venture to return the account the breakfast he had given them. It would have been too absurd to offer him in exchange for his excellent table, the very inferior one of Signor Pastrini. They told him so, frankly, and he received their excuses with the air of a man who appreciated their delicacy. Albert was charmed with the Count's manners, and he was only prevented from recognizing him for a perfect gentleman by reason of his varied knowledge. The permission to do what he liked with the carriage pleased him above all, for the fair peasants had appeared in a most elegant carriage the preceding evening, and Albert was not sorry to be upon an equal footing with them. At half-past one they descended. The coachman and footman had put on their livery over their disguises, which gave them a more ridiculous appearance than ever, and which gained them the applause of France and Albert. Albert had fastened the faded bunch of violets to his buttonhole. At the first sound of the bell they hastened into the Corso by the Via Vittoria. At the second turn a bunch of fresh violets, thrown from a carriage filled with harlequins, indicated to Albert that, like himself and his friend, the peasants had changed their costume also. And whether it was the result of chance, or whether a similar feeling had possessed them both, while he had changed his costume, they had assumed his. Albert placed the fresh bouquet in his buttonhole, but he kept the faded one in his hand, and when he again met the calash, he raised it to his lips, an action which seemed greatly to amuse not only the fair lady who had thrown it, but her joyous companions also. The day was as gay as the preceding one, perhaps even more animated and noisy. 
the count appeared for an instant at his window but when they again passed he had disappeared it is almost needless to say that the flirtation between albert and the fair peasant continued all day in the evening on his return franz found a letter from the embassy informing him that he would have the honor of being received by his holiness the next day at each previous visit he had made to rome he had solicited and obtained the same favor and incited as much by a religious feeling as by gratitude he was unwilling to quit the capital of the christian world without laying his respectful homage at the feet of one of st peter's successors who had set the rare example of all virtues he did not then think of the carnival for in spite of his condescension and touching kindness one cannot incline one's self without awe before the venerable and noble old man called gregory XVI. on his return from the vatican france carefully avoided the corso he brought away with him a treasure of pious thoughts to which the mad gaiety of the maskers would have been profanation at ten minutes past five albert entered overjoyed the harlequin had reassumed her peasant's costume and as she passed she raised her mask she was charming france congratulated albert who received his congratulations with the air of a man conscious that they are merited he had recognized by certain unmistakable signs that his fair incognita belonged to the aristocracy he had made up his mind to write to her the next day france remarked while he gave these details that albert seemed to have something to ask of him but that he was unwilling to ask it he insisted upon it declaring beforehand that he was willing to make any sacrifice the other wished albert let himself be pressed just as long as friendship required and then avowed to france that he would do him a great favor by allowing him to occupy the carriage alone the next day albert attributed to france's absence the extreme kindness of the fair present in raising her mask france was not sufficiently egotistical to stop albert in the middle of an adventure that promised to prove so agreeable to his curiosity and so flattering to his vanity he felt assured that the perfect indiscretion of his friend would duly inform him of all that happened and as during three years that he had travelled all over italy a similar piece of good fortune had never fallen to his share france was by no means sorry to learn how to act on such an occasion he therefore promised albert that he would content himself the morrow with witnessing the carnival from the windows of the rospoli palace the next morning he saw albert pass and repass holding an enormous bouquet which he doubtless meant to make the bearer of his amorous epistle this belief was changed into certainty when france saw the bouquet conspicuous by a circle of white camellias in the hand of a charming harlequin dressed in rose-colored satin the evening was no longer joy but delirium albert nothing doubted but that the fair unknown would reply in the same manner france anticipated his wishes by saying that the noise fatigued him and that he should pass the next day in writing and looking over his journal albert was not deceived for the next evening france saw him enter triumphantly shaking a folded paper which he held by one corner well said he was i mistaken she has answered you cried france read this word was pronounced in a manner impossible to describe france took the letter and read tuesday evening at seven o'clock descend from your carriage opposite the via dei pontifici and follow the roman peasant who snatches your torch from you when you arrive at the first step of the church of san giacomo be sure to fasten a knot of rose-colored ribbons to the shoulder of your harlequin costume in order that you may be recognized until then you will not see me constancy and discretion well asked he when france had finished what do you think of that i think that the adventure is assuming a very agreeable appearance i think so also replied albert and i very much fear you will go alone to the duke of bracciano's ball france and albert had received that morning an invitation from the celebrated roman banker take care albert said france all the nobility of rome will be present and if your fair incognita belong to the higher class of society 
she must go there whether she goes there or not my opinion is still the same returned albert you have read the letter yes you know i'm perfectly the women of the mezzocito are educated in italy this is the name of the lower class yes well read the letter again look at the writing and find if you can any blemish in the language or orthography the writer was in reality charming and the orthography irreproachable you are born to good fortune said france as he returned the letter laugh as much as you will replied albert i i mean love you allow me cried france i see that i shall not only go alone to the duke of bracciano's but also return to florence alone if my unknown be as amiable as she is beautiful said albert i shall fix myself at rome for six weeks at least i adore rome and i have always had a great taste for archaeology come two or three more such adventures and i do not despair of seeing you a member of the academy doubtless albert was about to discuss seriously his right to the academic chair when they were informed that dinner was ready albert's love had not taken away his appetite he hastened with france to seat himself free to recommence the discussion after dinner after dinner the count of monte cristo was announced they had not seen him for two days signor pastrini informed them that business had called him to civita vecchia he had started the previous evening and had only returned an hour since he was charming whether he kept a watch over himself or whether by accident he did not sound the acrimonious chords that in other circumstances had been touched he was tonight like everybody else the man was an enigma to france the count must feel sure that france recognized him and yet he had not let fall a single word indicating any previous acquaintance between them on his side however great france's desire was to allude to their former interview the fear of being disagreeable to the man who had loaded him and his friend with kindness prevented him from mentioning it the count had learned that the two friends had sent to secure a box at the argentina theatre and were told they were all let in consequence he brought them the key of his own at least such was the apparent motive of his visit france and albert made some difficulty alleging their fear of depriving him of it but the count replied that as he was going to the pali theatre the box at the argentina theatre would be lost if they did not profit by it this assurance determined the two friends to accept it france had by degrees become accustomed to the count's pallor which had so forcibly struck him at their first meeting he could not refrain from admiring the severe beauty of his features the only defect or rather the principal quality of which was the pallor truly a byronic hero france could not we will not say see him but even think of him without imagining his stern head upon manfred's shoulders or beneath lara's helmet his forehead was marked with the line that indicates the constant presence of bitter thoughts he had the fiery eyes that seemed to penetrate to the very soul and the haughty and disdainful upper lip that gives to the words it utters a peculiar character that impresses them on the minds of those to whom they are addressed the count was no longer young he was at least forty and yet it was easy to understand that he was formed to rule the young men with whom he associated at present and to complete his resemblance with the fantastic heroes of the english poet the count seemed to have the power of fascination albert was constantly expatiating on their good fortune in meeting such a man france was less enthusiastic but the count exercised over him also the ascendancy a strong mind always acquires over a mind less domineering he thought several times of the project the count had of visiting paris and he had no doubt but that with his eccentric character his characteristic face and his colossal fortune he would produce a great effect there and yet he did not wish to be at paris when the count was there the evening passed as evenings mostly pass at italian theatres that is not in listening to the music but in paying visits and conversing the countess g wished to revive the subject of the count but france announced he had something far newer to tell her 
and in spite of albert's demonstrations of false modesty he informed the countess of the great event which had preoccupied them for the last three days as similar intrigues are not uncommon in italy if we may credit travellers the comtesse did not manifest the least incredulity but congratulated albert on his success they promised upon separating to meet at the duke of bracciano's ball to which all rome was invited the heroine of the bouquet kept her word she gave albert no sign of her existence the morrow or the day after at length tuesday came the last and most tumultuous day of the carnival on tuesday the theatres open at ten o'clock in the morning as lent begins after eight at night on tuesday all those who through want of money time or enthusiasm have not been to see the carnival before mingle in the gaiety and contribute to the noise and excitement from two o'clock till five france and albert followed in the fete exchanging handfuls of confetti with the other carriages and the pedestrians who crowded amongst the horses feet and the carriage wheels without a single accident a single dispute or a single fight the fetes are veritable pleasure days to the italians the author of this history who has resided five or six years in italy does not recollect to have ever seen a ceremony interrupted by one of these events so common in other countries albert was triumphant in his harlequin costume a knot of rose-coloured ribbons fell from his shoulder almost to the ground in order that there might be no confusion france wore his peasant's costume as the day advanced the tumult became greater there was not on the pavement in the carriages at the windows a single tongue that was silent a single arm that did not move it was a human storm made up of a thunder of cries and a hall of sweetmeats flowers eggs oranges and nosegays at three o'clock the sound of fireworks let off on the piazza del popolo and the piazza di venezia heard with difficulty amid the din and confusion announced that the races were about to begin the races like the moccoli are one of the episodes peculiar to the last days of the carnival at the sound of the fireworks the carriages instantly broke ranks and retired by the adjacent streets all these evolutions are executed with an inconceivable address and marvellous rapidity without the police interfering in the matter the pedestrians range themselves against the walls then the trampling of horses and the clashing of steel were heard a detachment of cabiniers fifteen abreast galloped up the corso in order to clear it for the barberi when the detachment arrived at the piazza di venezia a second volley of fireworks was discharged to announce that the street was clear almost instantly in the midst of a tremendous and general outcry seven or eight horses excited by the shouts of three hundred thousand spectators passed by like lightning then the castle of saint angelo fired three cannon to indicate that number three had won immediately without any other signal the carriages moved on flowing on towards the corso down all the streets like torrents pent up for a while while again flow into the parent river and the immense stream again continued its course between its two granite banks a new source of noise and movement was added to the crowd the sellers of moccoletti entered on the scene the moccoli or moccoletti are candles which vary in size from the pascal taper to the rushlight and which give to each actor in the great final scene of the carnival two very serious problems to grapple with first how to keep his own moccoletto alight and secondly how to extinguish the moccoletti of others the moccoletto is like life man has found but one means of transmitting it and that one comes from god but he has discovered a thousand means of taking it away and the devil has somewhat aided him the moccoletto is kindled by approaching it to a light but who can describe the thousand means of extinguishing the moccoletto the gigantic bellows the monstrous extinguishers the superhuman fans everyone hastened to purchase moccoletti france and albert among the rest the night was rapidly approaching and already at the cry of moccoletti repeated by the shrill voices of a thousand vendors two or three stars began to burn among the crowd it was a signal 
at the end of ten minutes fifty thousand lights glittered descending from the palazzo di venezia to the piazza del popolo and mounting from the piazza del popolo to the palazzo di venezia it seemed like the fete of jack-o'-lanterns it is impossible to form any idea of it without having seen it suppose that all the stars had descended from the sky and mingled in a wild dance on the face of the earth the whole accompanied by cries that were never heard in any other part of the world the facino follows the prince the transteverin the citizen every one blowing extinguishing relighting had old aeolus appeared at this moment he would have been proclaimed king of the Mokoli, and Aquilo the heir presumptive to the throne. This battle of folly and flame continued for two hours. The Corso was light as day. The features of the spectators on the third and fourth stories were visible. Every five minutes Albert took out his watch. At length it pointed to seven. The two friends were in the Via del Pontifici. Albert sprang out bearing his moccoletto in his hand two or three masks strove to knock his moccoletto out of his hand but albert a first-rate pugilist sent them rolling in the street one after the other and continued his course towards the church of san giacomo the steps were crowded with masks who strove to snatch each other's torches france followed albert with his eyes and saw him mount the first step instantly a mask wearing the well-known costume of a peasant woman snatched his moccoletto from him without his offering any resistance france was too far off to hear what they said but without doubt nothing hostile passed for he saw albert disappear arm in arm with the peasant girl he watched them pass through the crowd for some time but at length he lost sight of them in the via macello suddenly the bell that gives the signal for the end of the carnival sounded and at the same instant all the moccoletti were extinguished as if by enchantment it seemed as though one immense blast of the wind had extinguished every one franz found himself in utter darkness no sound was audible save that of the carriages that were carrying the maskers home nothing was visible save a few lights that burnt behind the windows the carnival was over End of chapter 36。十七。of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。chapter 37。the catacombs of saint sebastian in his whole life perhaps france had never before experienced so sudden an impression so rapid a transition from gaiety to sadness as in this moment it seemed as though rome under the magic breath of some demon of the night had suddenly changed into a vast tomb by a chance which added yet more to the intensity of the darkness the moon which was on the wane did not rise until eleven o'clock and the streets which the young man traversed were plunged in the deepest obscurity the distance was short and at the end of ten minutes his carriage or rather the count's stopped before the hotel de londres dinner was waiting but as albert had told him that he should not return so soon franz sat down without him signor pastrini who had been accustomed to see them dine together inquired into the cause of his absence but france merely replied that albert had received on the previous evening an invitation which he had accepted the sudden extinction of the moccoletti the darkness which had replaced the light and the silence which had succeeded the turmoil had left in france's mind a certain depression which was not free from uneasiness he therefore dined very silently in spite of the officious attention of his host who presented himself two or three times to inquire if he wanted anything franz resolved to wait for albert as late as possible he ordered the carriage therefore for eleven o'clock desiring signor pastrini to inform him the moment that albert returned to the hotel at eleven o'clock albert had not come back franz dressed himself and went out telling his host that he was going to pass the night at the duke of bracciano's 
the house of the duke of bracciano is one of the most delightful in rome the duchess one of the last heiresses of the colonas does its honours with the most consummate grace and thus their fete have a european celebrity france and albert had brought to rome letters of introduction to them and their first question on his arrival was to inquire the whereabouts of his travelling companion france replied that he had left him at the moment they were all about to extinguish the mocoli and that he had lost sight of him in the via Michello. then he has not returned said the duke i waited for him until this hour replied france and do you know whither he went no not precisely however i think it was something very like a rendezvous diavolo said the duke this is a bad day or rather a bad night to be out late is it not countess these words were addressed to the countess g who had just arrived and was leaning on the arm of signor tolonia the duke's brother i think on the contrary that it is a charming night replied the countess and those who are here will complain of but one thing it's too rapid flight i'm not speaking said the duke with a smile of the persons who are here the men run no other danger than that of falling in love with you and the women of falling ill of jealousy at seeing you so lovely i meant persons who are out in the streets of rome ah asked the countess who is out in the streets of rome at this hour unless it be to go to a ball our friend albert de morcerf countess whom i left in pursuit of his unknown about seven o'clock this evening said france and whom i have not seen since and don't you know where he is not at all is he armed he is in masquerade you should not have allowed him to go said the duke to france you who know rome better than he does you might as well have tried to stop number three of the barbari who gained the prize in the race today replied france and then moreover what could happen to him who can tell the night is gloomy and the tiber is very near the via macello france felt a sudden shudder run through his veins at observing that the feeling of the duke and the countess was so much in unison with his own personal disquietude i informed them at the hotel that i had the honour of passing the night here duke said france and desired them to come and inform me of his return ah replied the duke here i think is one of my servants who is seeking you the duke was not mistaken when he saw france the servant came up to him your excellency he said the master of the hotel de londres has sent to let you know that a man is waiting for you with a letter from the vicomte of morcerf a letter from the vicomte exclaimed france yes and who is the man i do not know why did he not bring it to me here the messenger did not say and where is the messenger he went away directly he saw me enter the ballroom to find you oh said the countess to france go with all speed poor young man perhaps some accident has happened to him i will hasten replied france shall we see you again to give us any information inquired the countess yes if it is not any serious affair otherwise i cannot answer as to what i may do myself be prudent in any event said the countess oh pray be assured of that france took his hat and went away in haste he had sent away his carriage with orders for it to fetch him at two o'clock fortunately the palazzo bracciano which is on one side in the corso and on the other in the square of the holy apostles is hardly ten minutes walk from the hotel de londres as he came near the hotel france saw a man in the middle of the street he had no doubt that it was the messenger from albert the man was wrapped up in a large cloak he went up to him but to his extreme astonishment the stranger first addressed him what wants your excellency of me inquired the man retreating a step or two as if to keep on his guard are not you the person who brought me a letter inquired france from the vicomte of morcerf your excellency lodges at pastrini's hotel i do 
your excellency is the travelling companion of the viscount i am your excellency's name is the baron franz d'epinay then it is to your excellency that this letter is addressed is there any answer inquired franz taking the letter from him yes your friend at least hopes so come upstairs with me and i will give it to you i prefer waiting here said the messenger with a smile and why your excellency will know when you have read the letter shall i find you here then certainly franz entered the hotel on the staircase he met signor pastrini well said the landlord well what responded franz you have seen the man who desired to speak with you from your friend he asked of franz yes i have seen him he replied and he has handed this letter to me light the candles in my apartment if you please the innkeeper gave orders to a servant to go before france with a light the young man had found signor pastrini looking very much alarmed and this had only made him the more anxious to read albert's letter and so he went instantly towards the wax light and unfolded it it was written and signed by albert france read it twice before he could comprehend what it contained it was thus worded my dear fellow the moment you have received this have the kindness to take the letter of credit from my pocket-book which you will find in the square drawer of the secretary add your own to it if it be not sufficient run to torionia draw from him instantly four thousand piastres and give them to the bearer it is urgent that i should have this money without delay i do not say more rely on you as you may rely on me your friend albert de morcerf p s i now believe in italian banditti below these lines were written in a strange hand the following in italian se alle sei della mattina le quattro mille piastre non sono nelle mie mani alla sette il conte alberto avrà cessato di vivere luigi vampa if by six in the morning the four thousand piastre are not in my hands by seven o'clock the count albert will have ceased to live this second signature explained everything to france who now understood the objection of the messenger to coming up into the apartment the street was safer for him albert then had fallen into the hands of the famous bandit chief in whose existence he had for so long a time refused to believe there was no time to lose he hastened to open the secretary and found the pocket-book in the drawer and in it the letter of credit there were in all six thousand piastres but of these six thousand albert had already expended three thousand as to france he had no letter of credit as he lived at florence and had only come to rome to pass seven or eight days he had brought but a hundred louis and of these he had not more than fifty left thus seven or eight hundred piastres were wanting to them both to make up the sum that albert required true he might in such a case rely on the kindness of signor torlonia he was therefore about to return to the palazzo bracciano without loss of time when suddenly a luminous idea crossed his mind he remembered the count of monte cristo france was about to ring for signor pastrini when that worthy presented himself my dear sir he said hastily do you know if the count is within yes your excellency he has this moment returned is he in bed i should say no then ring at his door if you please and request him to be so kind as to give me an audience signor pastrini did as he was desired and returning five minutes after he said the count awaits your excellency franz went along the corridor and a servant introduced him to the count he was in a small room which franz had not yet seen and which was surrounded with divans the count came toward him well what good wind blows you hither at this hour and he have you come to sup with me it would be very kind of you no i have come to speak to you of a very serious matter a serious matter 
said the count looking at france with the earnestness usual to him and what may it be are we alone yes replied the count going to the door and returning france gave him albert's letter read that he said the count read it well well said he did you see the postscript i did indeed se alle sei della mattina le quattro mille piastre non sono nella mei mani alla sette il conte alberto avrà cessato di vivere luigi vampa what think you of that inquired franz have you the money he demands yes all but eight hundred piastres the count went to his secretary opened it and pulling out a drawer filled with gold said to franz i hope you will not offend me by applying to any one but myself you see on the contrary i come to you first and instantly replied franz and i thank you have what you will and he made a sign to franz to take what he pleased is it absolutely necessary then to send the money to luigi vampa asked the young man looking fixedly in his turn at the count judge for yourself replied he the postscript is explicit i think that if you would take the trouble of reflecting you could find a way of simplifying the negotiation said franz how so returned the count with surprise if we were to go together to luigi vampa i am sure he would not refuse you albert's freedom what influence can i possibly have over a bandit have you not just rendered him a service that can never be forgotten what is that have you not saved peppino's life well well said the count who told you that no matter i know it the count knit his brows and remained silent an instant and if i went to seek vampa would you accompany me if my society would not be disagreeable be it so it is a lovely night and a walk without rome will do us both good shall i take any arms for what purpose any money it is useless where is the man who brought the letter in the street he awaits the answer yes i must learn where we are going i will summon him thither it is useless he would not come up to your apartments perhaps but he will not make any difficulty at entering mine the count went to the window of the apartment that looked on to the street and whistled in a peculiar manner the man in the mantle quitted the wall and advanced into the middle of the street salite said the count in the same tone in which he would have given an order to his servant the messenger obeyed without the least hesitation but rather with alacrity and mounting the steps at a bound entered the hotel five seconds afterwards he was at the door of the room ah it is you peppino said the count but peppino instead of answering threw himself on his knees seized the count's hand and covered it with kisses ah said the count you have then not forgotten that i saved your life that is strange for it is a week ago no excellency and never shall i forget it returned peppino with an accent of profound gratitude never that is a long time but it is something that you believe so rise and answer peppino glanced anxiously at france oh you may speak before his excellency said he he is one of my friends you allow me to give you this title continued the count in french it is necessary to excite this man's confidence you can speak before me said france i am a friend of the count's good returned peppino i am ready to answer any questions your excellency may address to me how did the viscount albert fall into luigi's hands excellency the frenchman's carriage passed several times the one in which was teresa the chief's mistress yes the frenchman threw her a bouquet teresa returned it all this with the consent of the chief who was in the carriage what 
cried Franz. Was Luigi Vampa in the carriage with the Roman peasants? It was he who drove it disguised as the coachman, replied Peppino. Well, said the Count. Well, then, the Frenchman took off his mask. Teresa, with the chief's consent, did the same. The Frenchman asked for a rendezvous. Teresa gave him one. Only, instead of Teresa, it was Beppo who was on the steps of the church of San Giacomo. What? exclaimed Franz. The peasant girl who snatched his moccoletto from him? Was a lad of fifteen, replied Peppino. But it was no disgrace to your friend to have been deceived. Beppo has taken in plenty of others. And Beppo led him outside the walls, said the Count. Exactly so. A carriage was waiting at the end of the Via Marcello. Beppo got in, inviting the Frenchman to follow him, and he did not wait to be asked twice. He gallantly offered the right-hand seat to Beppo and sat by him. Beppo told him he was going to take him to a villa, a league from Rome. The Frenchman assured him he would follow him to the end of the world. The coachman went up the Via di Ripetta and the Porta San Paolo, and when they were two hundred yards inside as the Frenchman became somewhat too forward, Beppo put a brace of pistols to his head. The coachman pulled up and did the same. At the same time, four of the band who were concealed on the banks of the Almo surrounded the carriage. The Frenchman made some resistance and nearly strangled Beppo, but he could not resist a five-armed man and was forced to yield. They made him get out, walk along the banks of the river, and then brought him to Teresa and Luigi, who were waiting for him in the catacombs of San Sebastian. Well, said the Count, turning towards Franz, it seems to me that this is a very likely story. What did you say to it? Why, that I should think it very amusing, replied Franz, if it had happened to any one but poor Albert. And in the truth, if you had not found me here, said the Count, it might have proved a gallant adventure which would have cost your friend dear. But now, be assured, his alarm will be the only serious consequence. And shall we go and find him? inquired Franz. Oh, decidedly, sir. He is in a very picturesque place. Do you know the catacombs of St. Sebastian? I was never in them, but I have often resolved to visit them. Well, here is an opportunity made to your hand, and it would be difficult to contrive a better. Have you a carriage? No. That is of no consequence. I always have one ready, day and night. Always ready? Yes, I am a very capricious being, and I should tell you that sometimes, when I arise, or after my dinner, or in the middle of the night, I resolve on starting for some particular point, and away I go. The Count rang, and a footman appeared. Order out the carriage, he said, and remove the pistols which are in the holsters. You need not awaken the coachman. Ali will drive. In a very short time the noise of the wheels was heard and the carriage stopped at the door. The Count took out his watch. "'Half past twelve, he said. "'We might start at five o'clock and be in time, but the delay may cause your friend to pass an uneasy night, and therefore we had better go with all speed to extricate him from the hands of the infidels. Are you still resolved to accompany me?' "'More determined than ever. "'Well, then, come along.' Franz and the Count went downstairs, accompanied by Peppino. At the door they found the carriage. Ali was on the box, in whom Franz recognized the dumb slave of the grotto of Monte Cristo. Franz and the Count got into the carriage. Peppino placed himself beside Ali, and they set off at a rapid pace. Ali had received his instructions and went down the Corso, crossed the Campo Vaccino, went up the Strada San Gregorio, and reached the gates of San Sebastian. Then the porter raised some difficulties. But the Count of Monte Cristo produced a permit from the governor of Rome, allowing him to leave or enter the city at any hour of the day or night. The portcullis was therefore raised, the porter had a louis for his trouble, and they went on their way. 
the road which the carriage now traversed was the ancient appian way and bordered with tombs from time to time by the light of the moon which began to rise franz imagined that he saw something like a sentinel appear at various points among the ruins and suddenly retreat into the darkness on a signal from peppino a short time before they reached the baths of caracalla the carriage stopped peppino opened the door and the count and franz alighted in ten minutes said the count to his companion we shall be there he then took peppino aside gave him an order in a low voice and peppino went away taking with him a torch brought with them in the carriage five minutes elapsed during which france saw the shepherd going along a narrow path that led over the irregular and broken surface of the campagna and finally he disappeared in the midst of the tall red herbage which seemed like the bristling mane of an enormous lion now said the count let us follow him franz and the count in their turn then advanced along the same path which at the distance of a hundred paces led them over a declivity to the bottom of a small valley they then perceived two men conversing in the obscurity ought we to go on asked franz of the count or shall we wait a while let us go on peppino will have warned the sentry of our coming one of the two men was peppino and the other a bandit on the lookout franz and the count advanced and the bandit saluted them your excellency said peppino addressing the count if you will follow me the opening of the catacombs is close at hand go on then replied the count they came to an opening behind a clump of bushes and in the midst of a pile of rocks by which a man could scarcely pass peppino glided first into this crevice after they got along a few paces the passage widened peppino passed lighted his torch and turned to see if they came after him the count first reached an open space and franz followed him closely the passageway sloped in a gentle descent enlarging as they proceeded still franz and the count were compelled to advance in a stooping posture and were scarcely able to proceed abreast of one another they went on a hundred and fifty paces in this way and then were stopped by who comes there at the same time they saw the reflection of a torch on a carbine barrel a friend responded peppino and advancing alone towards the sentry he said a few words to him in a low tone and then he like the first saluted the nocturnal visitors making a sign that they may, may proceed behind the sentinel was a staircase with twenty steps franz and the count descended these and found themselves in a mortuary chamber five corridors diverged like the rays of a star and the walls dug into niche which were arranged one above the other in the shape of coffins showed that they were at last in the catacombs down one of the corridors whose extent it was impossible to determine rays of light were visible the count laid his hand on france's shoulder would you like to see a camp of bandits in repose he inquired exceedingly replied france come with me then peppino put out the torch peppino obeyed and france and the count were in utter darkness except that fifty paces in advance of them a reddish glare more evidence since peppino had put out his torch was visible along the wall they advanced silently the count guiding france as if he had the singular faculty of seeing in the dark france himself however saw his way more plainly in proportion as he went on towards the light which served in some manner as a guide three arcades were before them and the middle one was used as a door these arcades opened on one side into the corridor where the count and france were and on the other into a large square chamber entirely surrounded by niche similar to those of which we have spoken in the midst of this chamber were four stones which had formerly served as an altar as was evident from the cross which still surmounted them a lamp placed at the base of a pillar lighted up with its pale and flickering flame the singular scene which presented itself to the eyes of the two visitors concealed in the shadow a man was seated with his elbow leaning on the column and was reading with his back turned to the arcades through the openings of which the newcomers contemplated him this was the chief of the band luigi vampa 
around him and in groups according to their fancy lying in their mantles or with their backs against a sort of stone bench which went all around the columbarium were to be seen twenty brigands or more each having his carbine within reach at the other end silently scarcely visible and like a shadow was a sentinel who was walking up and down before a grotto which was only distinguishable because in that spot the darkness seemed more dense than elsewhere when the count thought france had gazed sufficiently on this picturesque tableau he raised his finger to his lips to warn him to be silent and ascending the three steps which led to the corridor of the columbarium entered the chamber by the middle arcade and advanced towards vampa who was so intent on the book before him that he did not hear the noise of his footsteps who comes a there cried the sentinel who was less abstracted and who saw by the lamplight a shadow approaching his chief at this challenge vampa rose quickly drawing at the same moment a pistol from his girdle in a moment all the bandits were on their feet and twenty carbines were leveled at the count well said he in a voice perfectly calm and no muscle of his countenance disturbed well my dear vampa it appears to me that you receive a friend with a great deal of ceremony ground arms exclaimed the chief with an imperative sign of the hand while with the other he took off his hat respectfully then turning to the singular personage who had caused this scene he said your pardon your excellency but i was so far from expecting the honour of a visit that i did not really recognise you it seems that your memory is equally short in everything vampa said the count and that not only do you forget people's faces but also the conditions you make with them what conditions have i forgotten your excellency inquired the bandit with the air of a man who having committed an error is anxious to repair it was it not agreed asked the count that not only my person but also that of my friends should be respected by you and how have i broken that treaty your excellency you have this evening carried off and conveyed hither the vicomte albert de morcerf well continued the count in a tone that made france shudder this young gentleman is one of my friends this young gentleman lodges in the same hotel as myself this young gentleman has been up and down the corso for eight hours in my private carriage and yet i repeat to you you have carried him off and conveyed him hither and added the count taking the letter from his pocket you have set a ransom on him as if he were an utter stranger why did you not tell me all this you inquired the brigand chief turning towards his men who all retreated before his look have you caused me thus to fall in my word towards a gentleman like the count who has all our lives in his hands by heavens if i thought one of you knew that the young gentleman was the friend of his excellency i would blow his brains out with my own hand well said the count turning towards france i told you there was some mistake in this are you not alone asked vampa with uneasiness i am with the person to whom this letter was addressed and to whom i desired to prove that luigi vampa was a man of his word come your excellency the count added turning to france here is luigi vampa who will himself express to you his deep regret at the mistake he has committed france approached the chief advancing several steps to meet him welcome among us your excellency he said to him you heard what the count just said and also my reply let me add that i would not for the four thousand piastres at which i had fixed your friend's ransom that this had happened but said france looking around him uneasily where is the vicomte i do not see him nothing has happened to him i hope said the count frowningly the prisoner is there replied vampa pointing to the hollow space in front of which the bandit was on guard and i will go myself and tell him he is free the chief went towards the place he had pointed out as albert's prison and france and the count followed him what is the prisoner doing inquired vampa of the sentinel ma foi captain replied the sentry 
i do not know for the last hour i have not heard him stir come in your excellency said vampa the count and franz ascended seven or eight steps after the chief who drew back a bolt and opened a door then by the gleam of a lamp similar to that which lighted the columbarium albert was to be seen wrapped up in a cloak which one of the bandits had lent to him lying in a corner in profound slumber come said the count smiling with his own peculiar smile not so bad for a man who is to be shot at seven o'clock to-morrow morning vampa looked at albert with a kind of admiration he was not insensible to such a proof of courage you are right your excellency he said this must be one of your friends then going to albert he touched him on the shoulder saying will your excellency please to awaken albert stretched out his arms rubbed his eyelids and opened his eyes oh said he is it you captain you should have allowed me to sleep i had such a delightful dream i was dancing the gallop at trolonio's with the countess g then he drew his watch from his pocket that he might see how time sped half past one only said he why the devil do you rouse me at this hour to tell you that you are free your excellency my dear fellow said albert with perfect ease of mind remember for the future napoleon's maxim never awaken me but for bad news if you had let me slip on i should have finished my gallop and have been grateful to you all my life so then they have paid my ransom no your excellency well then how am i free a person to whom i can refuse nothing has come to demand you come hither yes hither really then that person is a most amiable person albert looked around and perceived franz what said he is it you my dear franz whose devotion and friendship are thus displayed no not i replied franz but our neighbor the count of monte cristo oh my dear count said albert gaily arranging his cravat and wristbands you are really most kind and i hope you will consider me as under eternal obligations to you in the first place for the carriage and in the next for this visit and he put out his hand to the count who shuddered as he gave his own but who nevertheless did give it the bandit gazed on this scene with amazement he was evidently accustomed to see his prisoners tremble before him and yet here was one whose gay temperament was not that for a moment altered as for france he was enchanted at the way in which albert had sustained the national honor in the presence of the bandit my dear albert he said if you will make haste we shall yet have time to finish the night at torlonia's you may conclude your interrupted gallop so that you will owe no ill will to signor luigi who has indeed throughout this whole affair acted like a gentleman you are decidedly right and we may reach the palazzo by two o'clock signor luigi continued albert is there any formality to fulfil before i take leave of your excellency none sir replied the bandit you are as free as air well then a happy and merry life to you come gentlemen come and albert followed by france and the count descended the staircase crossed the square chamber where stood all the bandits hat in hand peppino said the brigand chief give me the torch what are you going to do inquired the count i will show you the way back myself said the captain that is the least honor that i can render to your excellency and taking the lighted torch from the hands of the herdsman he preceded his guests not as a servant who performs an act of civility but like a king who precedes ambassadors on reaching the door he bowed and now your excellency added he allow me to repeat my apologies and i hope you will not entertain any resentment at what has occurred no my dear vampa replied the count besides you compensate for your mistakes in so gentlemanly a way that one almost feels obliged to you for having committed them gentlemen 
added the chief turning towards the young men perhaps the offer may not appear very tempting to you but if you should ever feel inclined to pay me a second visit wherever i may be you shall be welcome france and albert bowed the count went out first then albert france paused for a moment has your excellency anything to ask me said vampa with a smile yes i have replied france i am curious to know what work you are perusing with so much attention as we entered caesar's commentaries said the bandit it is my favorite work well are you coming asked albert yes replied france here i am and he in his turn left the caves they advanced to the plain ah oh, your pardon said albert turning around will you allow me captain and he lighted his cigar at vampa's torch now my dear count he said let us on with all the speed we may i am enormously anxious to finish my night at the duke of bracciano's they found the carriage where they had left it the count said a word in arabic to ali and the horses went on at great speed it was just two o'clock by albert's watch when the two friends entered into the dancing room their return was quite an event but as they entered together all uneasiness on albert's account ceased instantly madame said the viscount of morcerf advancing towards the countess yesterday uh, you were so condescending as to promise me a gallop i am rather late in claiming this gracious promise but here is my friend whose character for veracity you will know and he will assure you the delay arose from no fault of mine and as at this moment the orchestra gave the signal for the waltz albert put his arm round the waist of the countess and disappeared with her in the whirl of dancers in the meanwhile france was considering the singular shudder that had passed over the count of monte cristo at the moment when he had been in some sort forced to give his hand to albert end of chapter 37chapter 38 of the count of monte cristo by alexandre dumas this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 38 the compact the first words that albert uttered to his friend on the following morning contained a request that france would accompany him on a visit to the count true the young man had warmly and energetically thanked the count on the previous evening but services such as he had rendered could never be too often acknowledged france who seemed attracted by some invisible influence towards the count in which terror was strangely mingled felt an extreme reluctance to permit his friend to be exposed alone to the singular fascination that this mysterious personage seemed to exercise over him and therefore made no objection to albert's request but at once accompanied him to the desired spot and after a short delay the count joined them in the salon my dear count said albert advancing to meet him permit me to repeat the poor thanks i offered last night and to assure you that the remembrance of all i owe to you will never be effaced from my memory believe me as long as i live i shall never cease to dwell with grateful recollection on the prompt and important service you rendered me and also to remember that to you i am indebted even for my life my dear a very good friend and excellent a neighbor replied the count with a smile you really exaggerate my trifling exertions you owe me nothing but some trifle of twenty thousand francs which you have been saved out of your traveling expenses so that there is not much of a score between us but you must really permit me to congratulate you on the ease and unconcern with which you resigned yourself to your fate and the perfect indifference you manifested as to the turn events might take upon my word said albert i deserve no credit for what i could not help namely a determination to take everything as i found it and to let those bandits see that although men get into troublesome scrapes all over the world there is no nation but the french that can smile 
even in the face of grim death itself. All that, however, has nothing to do with my obligations to you, and I now come to ask you whether, in my own person, my family, or connections, I can in any way serve you. My father, the Comte de Morcerf, although of Spanish origin, possesses considerable influence both at the court of France and Madrid, and I unhesitatingly place the best services of myself and all to whom my life is dear at your disposal. Monsieur de Morcerf, replied the Count, your offer, far from surprising me, is precisely what I expected from you, and I accept it in the same spirit of hearty sincerity with which it is made. Nay, I will go still further, and say that I had previously made up my mind to ask a great favour at your hands. Oh, pray name it. I am wholly a stranger to Paris. It is a city I have never yet seen. Is it possible, exclaimed Albert, that you have reached your present age without visiting the finest capital in the world? I can scarcely credit it. Nevertheless, it is quite true. Still, I agree with you in thinking that my present ignorance of the first city in Europe is a reproach to me in every way, and calls for immediate correction. But in all probability, I should have performed so important, so necessary a duty as that of making myself acquainted with the wonders and beauties of your justly celebrated capital, had I known any person who would have introduced me into the fashionable world, but unfortunately I possessed no acquaintance there, and of necessity was compelled to abandon the idea. "'So distinguished an individual as yourself,' cried Albert, "'could scarcely have required an introduction. "'You are most kind, but as regards myself, "'I can find no merit I possess, "'save that as a millionaire I might have become a partner "'in the speculations of Monsieur Aguado and Monsieur Rothschild.' but as my motive in travelling to your capital would not have been for the pleasure of dabbling in stocks. I stayed away still some favourable chance should present itself of carrying my wish into execution. Your offer, however, smooths all difficulties, and I have only to ask you, my dear Monsieur de Morcerf, these words were accompanied by a most peculiar smile, whether you undertake upon my arrival in France to open to me the doors of that fashionable world, of which I know no more than a Huron, or a native of Cochin, China. Oh, that I do, and with infinite pleasure, answered Albert, and so much the more readily, as a letter received this morning from my father, summons me to Paris in consequence of a treaty of marriage. My dear France, do not smile, I beg of you, with a family of high standing and connected with the very cream of Parisian society. "'Connected by marriage, you mean?' said Franz, laughingly. "'Well, never mind how it is,' answered Albert. "'It comes to the same thing in the end. Perhaps by the time you return to Paris I shall be quite a sober, staid father of a family. A most edifying representative I shall make of all the domestic virtues, don't you think so?' But as regards your wish to visit our fine city, my dear Count, I can only say that you may command me and mine to any extent you please. Then it is settled, said the Count, and I give you my solemn assurance that I only waited an opportunity like the present to realize the plans that I have long meditated. France did not doubt that these plans were the same concerning which the Count had dropped a few words in the grotto of Monte Cristo. And while the Count was speaking, the young man watched him closely, hoping to read something of his purpose in his face. But his countenance was inscrutable, especially when, as in the present case, it was veiled in a sphinx-like smile. "'But tell me now, Count,' exclaimed Albert, delighted at the idea of having to chaperone so distinguished a person as Monte Cristo. "'Tell me truly, whether you are in earnest, or if this project of visiting Paris is merely one of the chimerical and uncertain air castles of which we make so many in the course of our lives, but which, like a house built on the sand, 
is liable to be blown over by the first puff of wind i pledge you my honour returned the count that i mean to do as i have said both inclination and positive necessity compel me to visit paris when do you propose going thither have you made up your mind when you shall be there yourself certainly in a fortnight or three weeks time that is to say as fast as i can get there nay said the count i will give you three months ere i join you you see i make an ample allowance for all delays and difficulties and in three months time said albert you will be at my house shall we make a positive appointment for a particular day and hour inquired the count only let me warn you that i am proverbial for my punctilious exactitude in keeping my engagements day by day hour for hour said albert that will suit me to a dot so be it then replied the count and extending his hand towards a calendar suspended near the chimney-piece he said to-day is the twenty-first of february and drawing out his watch added it is exactly half past ten o'clock and now promise me to remember this and expect me the twenty-first of may at the same hour in the forenoon capital exclaimed albert your breakfast shall be waiting where do you live numero vingt-sept rue de elder have you bachelor's apartments there i hope my coming will not put you to any inconvenience i reside in my father's house but occupy a pavilion at the farther side of the courtyard entirely separated from the main building quite sufficient replied the count as taking out his tablets he wrote down number twenty seven rue de helder twenty first may half past ten in the morning now then said the count returning his tablets to his pocket make yourself perfectly easy the hand of your timepiece will not be more accurate in marking the time than myself shall i see you again ere my departure asked albert that depends when do you leave to-morrow evening at five o'clock in that case i must say adieu to you as i am compelled to go to naples and shall not return hither before saturday evening or sunday morning and you baron pursued the count addressing france do you also depart to-morrow yes for france no for venice i shall remain in italy for another year or two then we shall not meet in paris i fear i shall not have the honour well since we must part said the count holding out a hand to each of the young men allow me to wish you both a safe and pleasant journey it was the first time the hand of france had come in contact with that of the mysterious individual before him and unconsciously he shuddered at its touch for it felt cold and icy as that of a corpse let us understand each other said albert it is agreed is it not that you are to be at a numero vingt-sept in the rue du helder on the twenty-first of may at half past ten in the morning and your word of honour passed for your punctuality the twenty-first of may at half past ten in the morning rue du helder number twenty-seven replied the count the young men then rose and bowing to the count quitted the room what is the matter asked albert of france when they had returned to their own apartments you seem more than commonly thoughtful i will confess to you albert replied france the count is a very singular person and the appointment you have made to meet him in paris fills me with a thousand apprehensions my dear fellow exclaimed albert what can there possibly be in that to excite uneasiness why you must have lost your senses whether i am in my senses or not answered france that is the way i feel listen to me france said albert i am glad that the occasion has presented itself for saying this to you for i have noticed how cold you are in your bearing towards the count while he on the other hand has always been courtesy itself to us have you anything particular against him possibly did you ever meet him previously to coming hither i have and where will you promise me not to repeat a single word of what i am about to tell you 
I promise. Upon your honour? Upon my honour. Then listen to me. Franz then related to his friend the history of his excursion to the island of Monte Cristo, and of his finding a party of smugglers there, and the two Corsican bandits with them. He dwelt with considerable force and energy on the almost magical hospitality he had received from the Count, and the magnificence of his entertainment in the Grotto of the Thousand and One Nights. He recounted with circumstantial exactitude all the particulars of the supper, the hashish, the statues, the dream, and how at his awakening there remained no proof or trace of all these events, save the small yacht seen in the distant horizon, driving under full sail toward Porto Vecchio. Then he detailed a conversation overheard by him at the Colosseum, between the Count and Vampa, in which the Count had promised to obtain the release of the bandit Pipino, an engagement which, as our readers are aware, he most faithfully fulfilled. At last he arrived at the adventure of the preceding night, and the embarrassment in which he found himself placed by not having sufficient cash by six or seven hundred piastres to make up the sum required, and finally of his application to the Count and the picturesque and satisfactory result that followed. Albert listened with the most profound attention. "'Well,' said he, when France had concluded, "'what do you find to object to in all you have related? "'The Count is fond of travelling, "'and being rich, possesses a vessel of his own. "'Go but to Portsmouth or Southampton, "'and you will find the harbours crowded "'with the yachts belonging to such of the English "'as can afford the expense, "'and have the same liking for this amusement.' Now, by way of having a resting place during his excursions, avoiding the wretched cookery which has been trying its best to poison me during the last four months, while you have manfully resisted its effects for as many years, and obtaining a bed on which it is possible to slumber, Monte Cristo has furnished for himself a temporary abode where you first found him, but to prevent the possibility of the Tuscan government taking a fancy to his enchanted palace, and thereby depriving him of the advantages naturally expected from so large an outlay of capital, he has wisely enough purchased the island, and taken its name. Just ask yourself, my good fellow, whether there are not many persons of our acquaintance who assume the names of lands and properties they never in their lives were masters of. But, said Franz, the Corsican bandits that were among the crew of his vessel— why, really, the thing seems to me simple enough. Nobody knows better than yourself that the bandits of Corsica are not rogues or thieves, but purely and simple fugitives, driven by some sinister motive from their native town or village, and that their fellowship involves no disgrace or stigma. For my own part, I protest that should I ever go to Corsica, my first visit, ere even I presented myself to the mayor or prefect, should be to the bandits of Colomba if I could only manage to find them, for on my conscience they are a race of men I admire greatly. Still, persisted Franz, I suppose you will allow that such men as Vampa and his band are regular villains, who have no other motive than plunder when they seize your person. How do you explain the influence the Count evidently possessed over those ruffians? My good friend, as in all probability, I own my present safety to that influence. It would ill become me to search too closely into its source. Therefore, instead of condemning him for his intimacy with outlaws, you must give me leave to excuse any little irregularity there may be in such a connection, not altogether for preserving my life, for my own idea was that it never was in much danger, but certainly for saving me four thousand piastres, which being translated means neither more nor less than twenty-four thousand livres of our money, a sum at which most assuredly I should never have been estimated in France, proving most indisputably, added Albert with a laugh, <laughs> that no prophet is honoured in his own country. Talking of countries, replied France, of what country is the Count? What is his native tongue? Whence does he derive his immense fortune, and what were those events of his early life, a life as marvellous as unknown, that have tinctured his succeeding years with so dark and gloomy a misanthropy? Certainly, these are questions that in your place I should like to have answered. 
"'My dear Franz,' replied Albert, "'when upon receipt of my letter you found the necessity of asking the Count's assistance, "'you promptly went to him, saying, "'My friend Albert de Morcerf is in danger. Help me to deliver him. "'Was not that nearly what you said?' "'It was.' "'Well, then, did he ask you, "'Who is Monsieur Albert de Morcerf? "'How does he come by his name, his fortune? "'What are his means of existence? "'What is his birthplace? "'Of what country is he a native? "'Tell me, did he put all these questions to you?' "'I confess he asked me none. "'No, he merely came and freed me from the hands of Signor Vampa, "'where I can assure you, in spite of all my outward appearance of ease and unconcern, I did not very particularly care to remain. Now then, France, when for services so promptly and unhesitatingly rendered, he but asks me in return to do for him what is done daily for any Russian prince or Italian nobleman who may pass through Paris, merely to introduce him into society, would you have me refuse? My good fellow, you must have lost your senses to think it possible I could act with such cold-blooded policy. And this time it must be confessed that contrary to the usual state of affairs in discussions between the young men, the effective arguments were all on Albert's side. Well, said Franz with a sigh, do as you please, my dear Viscount, for your arguments are beyond my powers of refutation. Still, in spite of all, you must admit that this Count of Monte Cristo is a most singular personage. He is a philanthropist, answered the other, and no doubt his motive in visiting Paris is to compete for the Montyon Prize, given, as you are aware, to whoever shall be proved to have most materially advanced the interests of virtue and humanity. If my vote and interest can obtain it for him, I will readily give him the one and promise the other. And now, my dear Franz, let us talk of something else. Come, shall we take our luncheon, and then pay a last visit to St. Peter's? Franz silently assented, and the following afternoon, at half-past five o'clock, the young men parted, Albert de Morcerf to return to Paris, and Franz d'Epinay to pass a fortnight at Venice. But ere he entered his travelling carriage, Albert, fearing that his expected guest might forget the engagement he had entered into, placed in the care of a waiter at the hotel a card to be delivered to the Count of Monte Cristo, on which, beneath the name of Vicomte Albert de Morcerf, he had written in pencil, 27 Rue du Heller, on the 21st of May, half past 10 a.m. End of chapter 38《ハッタサティナイン・オブ・ザ・カウント・モンティ・クリスト・ボイ・アレクサンドラ・デュマ》This In the house in the Rue du Heller, where Albert had invited the Count of Monte Cristo, everything was being prepared on the morning of the 21st of May to do honour to the occasion. Albert de Morcerf inhabited a pavilion situated at the corner of a large court and directly opposite another building, in which were the servants' apartments. Two windows only of the pavilion faced the street. Three other windows looked into the court, and two at the back into the garden. Between the court and the garden, built in the heavy style of the imperial architecture, was the large and fashionable dwelling of the Count and Countess of Morcerf. A high wall surrounded the whole of the hotel, surmounted at intervals by vases filled with flowers, and broken in the centre by a large gate of gilded iron, which served as the carriage entrance. A small door, close to the lodge of the concierge, gave ingress and egress to the servants and masters when they were on foot. It was easy to discover that the delicate care of a mother, unwilling to part from her son, and yet aware that a young man of the Viscount's age required the full exercise of his liberty, had chosen this habitation for Albert. There were not lacking, however, evidences of what we may call the intelligent egoism of a youth who is charmed with the indolent, careless life of an only son, and who lives, as it were, in a gilded cage. 
by means of the two windows looking into the street albert could see all that passed the sight of what is going on is necessary to young men who always want to see the world traverse their horizon even if that horizon is only a public thoroughfare then should anything appear to merit a more minute examination albert de morcerf could follow up his researches by means of a small gate similar to that close to the concierge's door and which merits a particular description it was a little entrance that seemed never to have been opened since the house was built so entirely was it covered with dust and dirt but the well-oiled hinges and the locks told quite another story this door was a mockery to the concierge from whose vigilance and jurisdiction it was free and like that famous portal in the arabian nights opening at the sesame of ali baba it was wont to swing backward at a cabalistic word or a concerted tap from without from the sweetest voices or whitest fingers in the world at the end of a long corridor with which the door communicated and which formed the antechamber was on the right albert's breakfast room looking into the court and on the left the salon looking into the garden shrubs and creeping plants covered the windows and hid from the garden and court these two apartments the only rooms into which as they were on the ground floor the prying eyes of the curious could penetrate on the floor above were similar rooms with the addition of a third formed out of the antechamber these three rooms were a salon a boudoir and a bedroom the salon downstairs was only an algerian divan for the use of smokers the boudoir upstairs communicated with the bedchamber by an invisible door on the staircase it was evident that every precaution had been taken above this floor was a large atelier which had been increased in size by pulling down the partitions a pandemonium in which the artist and the dandy strove for preeminence there were collected and piled up all albert's successive caprices hunting horns bass vials flutes a whole orchestra for albert had had not a taste but a fancy for music easels palettes brushes pencils for music had been succeeded by painting foils boxing gloves broadswords and single sticks for following the example of the fashionable young men of the time albert de morcerf cultivated with far more perseverance than music and drawing the three arts that complete a dandy's education i e fencing boxing and single stick and it was here that he received grisier cook and charles le boucher the rest of the furniture of this privileged apartment consisted of old cabinets filled with chinese porcelain and japanese vases luca della robbia fabiense and palissy platters of old armchairs in which perhaps had sat henri the fourth or sully louis thirteenth or richelieu for two of these armchairs adorned with a carved shield on which were engraved the fleur-de-lis of france on an asia field evidently came from the louvre or at least some royal residence over these dark and sombre chairs were thrown splendid stuffs dyed beneath persia's sun or woven by the fingers of the women of calcutta or of chandanaga what these stuffs did there it was impossible to say they awaited while gratifying the eyes a destination unknown to their owner himself in the meantime they filled the place with their golden and silky reflections in the centre of the room was a roller and blanchet baby grand piano in rosewood but holding the potentialities of an orchestra in its narrow and sonorous cavity and groaning beneath the weight of the chef d'oeuvre of beethoven weber mozart haydn gretry and popora on the walls over the doors on the ceiling were swords daggers malay creases maces battle axes gilded damasked and inlaid suits of armour dried plants minerals and stuffed birds their flame-coloured wings outspread in motionless flight and their beaks forever open this was albert's favourite lounging place however the morning of the appointment the young man had established himself in the small salon downstairs there on a table surrounded at some distance by a large and luxurious divan every species of tobacco known from the yellow tobacco of petersburg to the black of sinai and so on along the scale from maryland and puerto rico to latakia was exposed in pots of crackled earthenware of which the dutch are so fond beside them in boxes of fragrant wood were ranged according to their size and quality pueros regalias havanas and manilas 
and in an open cabinet a collection of german pipes of chibouks with their amber mouthpieces ornamented with coral and of narghils with their long tubes of morocco awaiting the caprice or the sympathy of the smokers albert had himself presided at the arrangement or rather the symmetrical derangement which after coffee the guests at a breakfast of modern days love to contemplate through the vapour that escapes from their mouths and ascends in long and fanciful wreaths to the ceiling at a quarter to ten a valet entered he composed with a little groom named john and who only spoke english all albert's establishment although the cook of the hotel was always at his service and on great occasions the count's chasseur also this valet whose name was germain and who enjoyed the entire confidence of his young master held in one hand a number of papers and in the other a packet of letters which he gave to albert albert glanced carelessly at the different missives selected two written in a small and delicate hand and enclosed in scented envelopes opened them and perused their contents with some attention how did these letters come said he one by the post madame danglars footman left the other let madame danglars know that i accept the place she offers me in her box wait then during the day tell rosa that when i leave the opera i will sup with her as she wishes take her six bottles of different wine cyprus sherry and malaga and a barrel of ostend oysters get them at borel's and be sure you say they are for me at what o'clock sir do you breakfast what time is it now a quarter to ten very well at half past ten debray will perhaps be obliged to go to the minister and besides albert looked at his tablets it is the hour i told the count twenty-first of may at half past ten and though i do not much rely upon his promise i wish to be punctual is the countess up yet if you wish i will inquire yes ask her for one of her liquor cellarettes mine is incomplete and tell her i shall have the honour of seeing her about three o'clock and that i request a permission to introduce someone to her the valet left the room albert threw himself on the divan tore off the cover of two or three of the papers looked at the theatre announcements made a face seeing they gave an opera and not a ballet hunted vainly amongst the advertisements for a new tooth powder of which he had heard and threw down one after the other the three leading papers of paris muttering these papers become more and more stupid every day a moment after a carriage stopped before the door and the servant announced monsieur lucien de bray a tall young man with light hair clear gray eyes and thin and compressed lips dressed in a blue coat with beautifully carved gold buttons a white neckcloth and a tortoiseshell eyeglass suspended by a silken thread and which by an effort of superciliary and zygomatic muscles he fixed in his eye entered with a half official air without smiling or speaking good morning lucien good morning said albert your punctuality really alarms me what do i say punctuality you whom i expected last you arrive at five minutes to ten when the time fixed was half past has the ministry resigned no my dear fellow returned the young man seating himself on the divan reassure yourself we are tottering always but we never fall and i begin to believe that we shall pass into a state of immobility and then the affairs of the peninsula will completely consolidate us ah uh, true you drive don carlos out of spain no no my dear fellow do not confound our plans we take him to the other side of the french frontier and offer him hospitality at bourges at bourges yes he has not much to complain of bourges is the capital of charles VII. do you not know that old paris knew it yesterday and the day before it had already transpired on the bourse and m danglars i do not know by what means that man contrives to obtain intelligence as soon as we do made a million and you another order for i see you have a blue ribbon at your buttonhole yes they sent me the order of charles III, returned de bray carelessly come do not affect indifference but confess you are pleased to have it 
"'Oh, it is very well as I finish to the toilet. "'It looks very neat on a black coat buttoned up. "'And makes you resemble the Prince of Wales or the Duke of Reichstadt. "'It is for that reason you see me so early. "'Because you have the order of Charles III, "'and you wish to announce the good news to me? "'No, because I passed the night writing letters, five and twenty dispatch. "'I returned home at daybreak and strove to sleep,' but my head ached, and I got up to have a ride for an hour. At the Bois du Bologne, ennui and hunger attacked me at once. Two enemies who rarely accompany each other, and who are yet leagued against me, a sort of Carlo-Republican alliance. I then recollected, you gave a breakfast this morning, and here I am. I am hungry, feed me. I am bored, amuse me. "'It is my duty as your host,' returned Albert, ringing the bell, while Lucien turned over with his gold-mounted cane the papers that lay on the table. "'Germain, a glass of sherry and a biscuit. In the meantime, my dear Lucien, here are cigars, contraband, of course. Try them and persuade the minister to sell us such instead of poisoning us with cabbage leaves.' "'Pist! I will do nothing of the kind.' The moment they come from gouvernement, you would find them execrable. Besides, that does not concern the home, but the financial department. Address yourself to Monsieur Human, section of the indirect contributions, corridor A, numero 26. On my word, said Albert, you astonish me by the extent of your knowledge. Take a cigar. Really, my dear Albert, replied Lucien, lighting a manila at a rose-coloured taper that burnt in a beautifully enamelled stand. "'How happy you are to have nothing to do! You do not know your own good fortune!' "'And what would you do, my dear diplomatist?' replied Morcerf, with a slight degree of irony in his voice. "'If you did nothing, what? Private secretary to a minister? Plunged at once into European cabals and Parisian intrigue? Having kings and better still queens to co protect parties to unite elections to direct making more use of your cabinet with your pen and your telegraph than napoleon did of his battlefields with his sword and his victories possessing five and twenty thousand francs a year besides your place a horse for which chateau renaud offered you four hundred louis and which you would not part with a tailor who never disappoints you with the opera the jockey club and other diversions, can you not amuse yourself? Well, I will amuse you. How? By introducing you to a new acquaintance. A man or a woman? A man. I know so many men already. But you do not know this man. Where does he come from? The end of the world? Farther still, perhaps. The deuce! I hope he does not bring our breakfast with him. "'Oh, no. Our breakfast comes from my father's kitchen. Are you hungry?' "'Humiliating as such a confession is, I am. But I dined at Monsieur de Villefort's, and lawyers always give you very bad dinners. You would think they felt some remorse. Did you ever remark that?' "'Ah, depreciate other persons' dinners. You ministers give such splendid ones.' "'Yes, but we do not invite people of fashion.' If we were not forced to entertain a parcel of country boobies because they think and vote with us, we should never dream of dining at home, I assure you. Well, take another glass of sherry and another biscuit. Willingly. Your Spanish wine is excellent. You see, we were quite right to pacify that country. Yes, but uh, Don Carlos? Well, Don Carlos will drink Bordeaux, and in ten years we will marry his son to the little queen. You will then obtain the golden fleece, if you are still in the ministry. I think, Albert, you have adopted the system of feeding me on smoke this morning. Well, you must allow it is the best thing for the stomach. But I hear Beauchamp in the next room. You can dispute together, and that will pass away the time. About what? About the papers. My dear friend, said Lucien with an air of sovereign contempt, do I ever read the papers? Then you will dispute the more. 
monsieur beauchamp announced the servant come in come in said albert rising and advancing to meet the young man here is dubray who detests you without reading you so he says he is quite right returned beauchamp for i criticize him without knowing what he does good day commander ah you know all that already said the private secretary smiling and shaking hands with him pardieu and what do they say of it in the world in which world we have so many worlds in the year of grace uh, in the entire political world of which you are one of the leaders they say that it is quite fair and that sowing so much red you ought to reap a little blue come come that is not bad said lucien why do you not join our party my dear beauchamp with your talents you would make your fortune in three or four years i only wait one thing before following your advice that is a minister who will hold office for six months my dear albert one word for i must give poor lucien a respite do we breakfast or dine i must go to the chamber for our life is not an idle one you only breakfast i await two persons and the instant they arrive we shall sit down to table end of chapter thirty nine Chapter Forty of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty, the breakfast. And what sort of persons do you expect to breakfast? Said Beauchamp. A gentleman and a diplomatist. Then we shall have to wait two hours for the gentleman and three for the diplomatist. I shall come back to dessert keep me some strawberries coffee and cigars i shall take a cutlet on my way to the chamber do not do anything of the sort for were the gentleman a montmorency and the diplomatist a metanic we will breakfast at eleven in the meantime follow de Bray's example and take a glass of sherry and a biscuit be it so I, sh I will stay i must do something to distract my thoughts you are like de Bray, and yet it seems to me that uh, when the minister is out of spirits the opposition ought to be joyous ah you do not know with what i am threatened i shall hear this morning that m danglars made a speech at the chamber of deputies and at his wife's this evening i shall hear the tragedy of a peer of france the devil take the constitutional government and since we had our choice as they say at least how could we choose that i understand you must lay in a stock of hilarity do not run down m danglars speeches said debray he votes for you for he belongs to the opposition pardieu that is exactly the worst of all i am waiting until you send him to speak at the luxembourg to laugh at my ease my dear friend said albert to beauchamp it is plain that the affairs of spain are settled for you are most desperately out of humour this morning recollect uh, that parisian gossip has spoken of a marriage between myself and mademoiselle genet danglars i cannot in conscience therefore let you run down the speeches of a man who will one day say to me vicomte you know i give my daughter two millions ah this marriage will never take place said beauchamp the king has made him a baron and can make him a peer but he cannot make him a gentleman and the count of morcerf is too aristocratic to consent for the paltry sum of two million francs to a mesalliance the viscount of morcerf can only wed a marchioness but two million francs make a nice little sum replied morcerf it is the social capital of a theatre on the boulevard or a railroad from the jardin des plantes de la rapée never mind what he says morcerf said debray do you marry her you marry a money-bag label it is true well but what does it matter it is better to have a blazon less and a figure more on it you have seven martlets on your arms give three to your wife and you will still have four that is one more than monsieur de guise had who so nearly became the king of france and whose cousin was emperor of germany on my word i think you are right lucien said albert absently to be sure besides every millionaire is as noble as a bastard that is he can be 
"'Do not say that, de Bray,' returned Beauchamp, laughing, "'for here is Chateau Renaud, who, to cure you of your mania for paradoxes, "'will pass the award of Renaud de Montauban, his ancestor, through your body.' "'He will sully it, then,' returned Lucien, "'for I am low, very low.' "'Oh, heavens!' cried Beauchamp. "'The minister quotes Béranger. "'What shall we come to next?' "'Monsieur de Chateau Renaud, Monsieur Maximilien Morel,' said the servant, announcing two fresh guests. "'Now then, to breakfast,' said Beauchamp, "'for if I remember, you told me you only expected two persons, Albert.' "'Morel,' muttered Albert. "'Morel? Who is he?' But before he had finished, Monsieur de Chateau Renaud, a handsome young man of thirty, gentlemen all over that is with the figure of a guiche and the wit of a montemart took albert's hand my dear albert said he let me introduce you to monsieur maximilien morel captain of sa fille my friend and what is more however the man speaks for himself my preserver a salute my hero viscount and he stepped on one side to give place to a young man of refined and dignified bearing with large and open brow, piercing eyes, and black moustache, whom our readers have already seen at Marseilles under circumstances sufficiently dramatic not to be forgotten. A rich uniform, half French, half Oriental, set off his graceful and stalwart figure, and his broad chest was decorated with the Order of the Legion of Honour. The young officer bowed with easy and elegant politeness. Monsieur, said Albert with affectionate courtesy, the count of chateau renaud knew how much pleasure this introduction would give me you are his friend be ours also well said interrupted chateau renaud and pray that if you should ever be in a similar predicament he may do as much for you as he did for me what has he done asked albert oh nothing worth speaking of said morel monsieur de chateau renaud exaggerates not worth speaking of cried chateau renaud life is not worth speaking of that is rather too philosophical on my word morel it is very well for you who risk your life every day but for me who only did so once we gather from all this baron that captain morel saved your life exactly so on what occasion asked beauchamp beauchamp my good fellow you know i am starving said debray do not set him off on some long story well i do not prevent your sitting down to table replied beauchamp chateau renaud can tell us while we eat our breakfast gentlemen said morcerf it is only a quarter past ten and i expect someone else ah true a diplomatist observed debray diplomat or not i don't know i only know that he charged himself on my account with a mission which he terminated so entirely to my satisfaction that had i been king i should have instantly created him knight of all my orders even had i been able to offer him the golden fleece and the garter well since we are not to sit down to table said debray take a glass of sherry and tell us all about it you all know that i had the fancy of going to africa it is a road your ancestors have traced for you said albert gallantly yes but i doubt that your object was like theirs to rescue the holy sepulchre you are quite right beauchamp observed the young aristocrat it was only to fight as an amateur i cannot bear duelling since two seconds whom i had chosen to arrange an affair forced me to break the arm of one of my best friends one whom you all know poor france d'epinay ah true said debray you did fight some time ago about what the devil take me if i remember returned chateau renaud but i recollect perfectly one thing that being unwilling to let such talents as mine sleep i wished to try upon the arabs the new pistols that had been given to me in consequence i embarked for oran and went from thence to constantine where i arrived just in time to witness the raising of the siege i retreated with the rest for eight and forty hours i endured the rain during the day and the cold during the night tolerably well and the third morning my horse died of cold 
poor brute accustomed to be covered up and to have stove in the stable the arabian finds himself unable to bear ten degrees of cold in arabia that's why you want to purchase my english horse said de bray you think he will bear the cold better you are mistaken for i have made a vow never to return to africa you were very much frightened then asked beauchamp well yes and i had good reason to be so replied chateau renaud i was retreating on foot for my horse was dead six arabs came up full gallop to cut off my head i shot two with my double barrel gun and two more with my pistols but i was then disarmed and two were still left one seized me by the hair that is why i now wear it so short for no one knows what may happen the other swung a yatagan and i already felt the cold steel on my neck when this gentleman whom you see here charged them shot the one who held me by the hair and cleft the skull of the other with his saber he had assigned himself the task of saving a man's life that day chance caused that man to be myself when i am rich i will order a statue of chance from clagman or marocchetti yes said morel smiling it was the fifth of september the anniversary of the day on which my father was miraculously preserved therefore as far as it lies in my power i endeavour to celebrate it by some heroic action interrupted chateau renaud i was chosen but that is not all after rescuing me from the sword he rescued me from the cold not by sharing his cloak with me like saint martin but by giving me the whole then from hunger by sharing with me guess what a strasbourg pie asked beauchamp no his horse of which we each of us ate a slice with a hearty appetite it was very hard the horse said morcerf laughing no the sacrifice returned chateau renaud ask de bray if he would sacrifice his english steed for a stranger not for a stranger said de bray but for a friend i might perhaps i divined that you would become mine count replied morel besides as i had the honour to tell you heroism or not sacrifice or not that day i owed an offering to bad fortune in recompense for the favours good fortune had on other days granted to us the history to which monsieur morel alludes continued chateau renaud is an admirable one which he will tell you some day when you are better acquainted with him to-day let us fill our stomachs and not our memories what time do you breakfast albert at half past ten precisely asked de bray taking out his watch oh you will give me five minutes grace replied morcerf for i also expect a preserver of whom of myself cried morcerf parbleu do you think i cannot be saved as well as anyone else and that there are only arabs who cut off heads our breakfast is a philanthropic one and we shall have at table at least i hope so two benefactors of humanity what shall we do said de bray we have only one monthion prize well it will be given to someone who has done nothing to deserve it said beauchamp that is the way the academy mostly escapes from the dilemma and where does he come from asked de bray you have already answered the question once but so vaguely that i venture to put it a second time really said albert i do not know when i invited him three months ago he was then at rome but since that time who knows where he may have gone and you think him capable of being exact demanded de bray i think him capable of everything well with the five minutes grace we have only ten left i will profit by them to tell you something about my guest i beg your pardon interrupted beauchamp are there any materials for an article in what you are going to tell us yes and for a most curious one go on then for i see i shall not get to the chamber this morning and i must make up for it i was at rome during the last carnival we know that said beauchamp yes but what you do not know is that i was carried off by bandits there are no bandits cried de bray 
yes there are and most hideous or rather most admirable ones for i found them ugly enough to frighten me come my dear albert said debray confess that your cook is behind hand that the oysters have not arrived from ostend or marraine and that like madame de montenon you are going to replace the dish by a story say so at once we are sufficiently well bred to excuse you and to listen to your history fabulous as it promises to be and i say to you fabulous as it may seem i tell it as a true one from the beginning to the end the brigands had carried me off and conducted me to a gloomy spot called the catacombs of saint sebastian i know it said chateau renaud i narrowly escaped catching a fever there and i did more than that replied morcerf for i caught one i was informed that i was prisoner until i paid the sum of four thousand roman crowns about twenty four thousand francs unfortunately i had not above uh, fifteen hundred i was at the end of my journey and of my credit i wrote to france and were he here he would confirm every word i wrote then to france that if he did not come with the four thousand crowns before six at ten minutes past i should have gone to join the blessed saints and glorious martyrs in whose company i had the honour of being and signor luigi vampa such was the name of the chief of these bandits would have scrupulously kept his word but france did come with the four thousand crowns said chateau renaud a man whose name is france d'epinay or albert de morcerf has not much difficulty in procuring them no he arrived accompanied simply by the guest i am going to present to you ah this gentleman is a hercules a killing cacou a perseus freeing andromeda no he is a man about my own size armed to the teeth he had not even a knitting needle but he paid your ransom he said two words to the chief and i was free and they apologized to him for having carried you off said beauchamp just so why he is a second ariosto no his name is the count of monte cristo there is no count of monte cristo said debray i do not think so added chateau renaud with the air of a man who knows the whole of the european nobility perfectly does anyone know of anything of a count of monte cristo he comes possibly from the holy land and one of his ancestors possessed calvary as the montmartre did the dead sea i think i can assist your researches said maximilian monte cristo is a little island i have often heard spoken of by the old sailors of my father employed a grain of sand in the centre of the mediterranean an atom in the infinite precisely cried albert well he of whom i speak is the lord and master of this grain of sand of this atom he has purchased the title of count somewhere in tuscany he is rich then i believe so but that ought to be visible that is what deceives you de Bray. i do not understand you have you read the arabian nights what a question well uh, do you know if the persons you see there are rich or poor if their sacks of wheat are not rubies or diamonds they seem like poor fishermen and suddenly they open some mysterious cavern filled with the wealth of the indies which means which means that my count of monte cristo is one of those fishermen he has even a name taken from the book since he calls himself sinbad the sailor and as a cave filled with gold and you have seen this cavern morcerf asked beauchamp no but france has for heaven's sake not a word of this before him france went in with his eyes blindfolded and was waited on by mutes and by women to whom cleopatra was a painted strumpet only he is not quite sure about the women for they did not come until after he had taken hashish so that what he took for women might have been simply a row of statues the two young men looked at morcerf as if to say are you mad or are you laughing at us and i also said morel thoughtfully have heard something like this from an old sailor named penelon ah cried albert 
"'It is very lucky that Monsieur Morel comes to aid me. "'You are vexed, are you not, "'that he thus gives a clue to the labyrinth?' "'My dear Albert,' said Debray, "'what you tell us is so extraordinary.' Ah, uh, because your ambassadors and your consuls do not tell you of them they have no time they are too much taken up with interfering in the affairs of their countrymen who travel how you get angry and attack our poor agents how will you have them protect you the chamber cuts down their salaries every day so that now they have scarcely any will you be ambassador albert i will send you to constantinople no lest on the first demonstration i make in favour of mehmet ali the sultan send me the bowstring and makes my secretary strangle me you say very true responded debray yes said albert but this has nothing to do with the existence of the count of monte cristo pardieu everyone exists doubtless but not in the same way everyone has not black slaves a princely retinue an arsenal of weapons that would do credit to an arabian fortress horses that cost six thousand francs apiece and greek mistresses have you seen the greek mistress i have both seen and heard her i saw her at the theatre and heard her one morning when i breakfasted with the count he eats then yes but so little it can hardly be called eating he must be a vampire laugh if you will the countess g who knew lord ruthven declared that the count was a vampire ah capital said beauchamp for a man not connected with newspapers here is the pendant to the famous sea serpent of the constitutionnel wild eyes the iris of which contracts or dilates at pleasure said debray facial angle strongly developed magnificent forehead livid complexion black beard sharp and white teeth politeness unexceptionable just so lucien returned morcerf you have described him feature for feature yes keen and cutting politeness this man has often made me shudder and one day that we were viewing an execution i thought i should faint more from hearing the cold and calm manner in which he spoke of every description of torture than from the sight of the executioner and the culprit did he not conduct you to the ruins of the coliseum and suck your blood asked beauchamp or having delivered you make you sign a flaming parchment surrendering your soul to him as esau did his birthright rail on rail on at your ease gentlemen said morcerf somewhat piqued when i look at you parisian idler on the boulevard de grand or the bois de boulogne and think of this man it seems to me we are not of the same race i am highly flattered returned beauchamp at the same time added chateau renaud your count of monte cristo is a very fine fellow always accepting his little arrangements with the italian banditti there are no italian banditti said debray no vampire cried beauchamp no count of monte cristo added debray there is half past ten striking albert confess you have dreamed this and let us sit down to breakfast continued beauchamp but the sound of the clock had not died away when germain announced his excellency the count of monte cristo the involuntary start every one gave proved how much morcerf's narrative had impressed them and albert himself could not wholly refrain from manifesting sudden emotion he had not heard a carriage stop in the street or steps in the antechamber the door had itself opened noiselessly the count appeared dressed with the greatest simplicity but the most fastidious dandy could have found nothing to cavil at in his toilet every article of dress hat coat gloves and boots was from the first makers he seemed scarcely five-and-thirty but what struck everybody was his extreme resemblance to the portrait de Bray had drawn the count advanced smiling into the centre of the room and approached albert who hastened towards him holding out his hand in a ceremonial manner punctuality said monte cristo is the politeness of kings according to one of your sovereigns i think 
but it is not the same with travellers however i hope you will excuse the two or three seconds i am behindhand five hundred leagues are not to be accomplished without some trouble and especially in france where it seems it is forbidden to beat the postilions my dear count replied albert i was announcing your visit to some of my friends whom i had invited in consequence of the promise you did me the honour to make and whom i now present to you they are the count of chateau renaud whose nobility goes back to the twelve peers and whose ancestors had a place at the brown table monsieur lucien de bray private secretary to the minister of the interior monsieur beauchamp an editor of a paper and the terror of the french gouvernement but of whom in spite of his national celebrity you perhaps have not heard in italy since his paper is prohibited there and monsieur maximilian morel captain of sa fille at this name the count who had hitherto saluted every one with courtesy but at the same time with coldness and formality stepped a pace forward and a slight tinge of red colored his pale cheeks you wear the uniform of the new french conquerors monsieur said he it is a handsome uniform no one could have said what caused the count's voice to vibrate so deeply and what made his eye flash which was in general so clear lustrous and limpid when he pleased you have never seen our africans count said albert never replied the count who was by this time perfectly master of himself again well beneath this uniform beats one of the bravest and noblest arts in the whole army oh monsieur de morcerf interrupted morel uh, let me go on captain and we have just heard continued albert of a new deed of his and so heroic a one that although i have seen him to-day for the first time i request you to allow me to introduce him as my friend at these words it was still possible to observe in monte cristo the concentrated look changing colour and slight trembling of the eyelid that show emotion ah you have a noble heart said the count so much the better this exclamation which corresponded to the count's own thought rather than to what albert was saying surprised everybody and especially morel who looked at monte cristo with wonder but at the same time the intonation was so soft that however strange the speech might seem it was impossible to be offended at it why should he doubt it said beauchamp to chateau renaud in reality replied the latter who with his aristocratic glance and his knowledge of the world had penetrated at once all that was penetrable in monte cristo albert has not deceived us for the count is a most singular being what say you morel ma foi he has an open look about him that pleases me in spite of the singular remark he has made about me gentlemen said albert germain informs me that breakfast is ready my dear count allow me to show you the way they passed silently into the breakfast room and every one took his place gentlemen said the count seating himself permit me to make a confession which must form my excuse for any improprieties i may commit i am a stranger and a stranger to such a degree that this is the first time i have ever been at paris the french way of living is utterly unknown to me and up to the present time i have followed the eastern customs which are entirely in contrast to the parisian i beg you therefore to excuse if you find anything in me too turkish too italian or too arabian now then let us breakfast with what an air he says all this muttered beauchamp decidedly he is a great man a great man in his own country added debray a great man in every country monsieur debray said chateau renaud the count was it may be remembered a most temperate guest albert remarked this expressing his fears lest at the outset the parisian mode of life should displease the traveller in the most essential point my dear count said he i fear one thing and that is that the fare of the rue du helder is not so much to your taste as that of the piazza di spagni i ought to have consulted you on the point and have had some dishes prepared expressly 
did you know me better returned the count smiling you would not give one thought of such a thing for a traveller like myself who has successfully lived on macaroni at naples polenta at milan or la podrida at valencia pilau at constantinople carrick in india and swallow's nests in china i eat everywhere and of everything only i eat but little and to-day that you reproach me with my want of appetite is my day of appetite for i have not eaten since yesterday morning what cried all the guests you have not eaten for four-and-twenty hours no replied the count i was forced to go out of my road to obtain some information near nîmes so that i was somewhat late and therefore i did not choose to stop and you ate in your carriage asked morcerf no i slept as i generally do when i am weary without having the courage to amuse myself or when i am hungry without feeling inclined to eat but you can sleep when you please monsieur said morel yes you have a recipe for it an infallible one that would be invaluable to us in africa who have not always any food to eat and rarely anything to drink yes said monte cristo but unfortunately a recipe excellent for a man like myself would be very dangerous applied to an army which might not awake when it was needed may we inquire what is this recipe asked debray oh yes sir, returned monte cristo i make no secret of it it is a mixture of excellent opium which i fetched myself from canton in order to have it pure and the best hashish which grows in the east that is between the tigris and the euphrates these two ingredients are mixed in equal proportions and formed into pills ten minutes after one is taken the effect is produced asked baron franz d'epinay i think he tasted them one day yes replied morcerf he said something about it to me but said beauchamp who as became a journalist was very incredulous you always carries this drug about you always would it be an indiscretion to ask to see these precious pills continued beauchamp hoping to take him at a disadvantage no monsieur returned the count and he drew from his pocket a marvellous casket formed out of a single emerald and closed by a golden lid which unscrewed and gave passage to a small greenish coloured pellet about the size of a pea this ball had an acrid and penetrating odour there were four or five more in the emerald which would contain about a dozen the casket passed around the table but it was more to examine the admirable emerald than to see the pills that it passed from hand to hand and is it your cook who prepares these pills asked beauchamp oh no monsieur replied monte cristo i do not thus betray my enjoyments to the vulgar i am a tolerable chemist and prepare my pills myself this is a magnificent emerald and the largest i have ever seen said chateau renaud although my mother has some remarkable family jewels i had three similar ones returned monte cristo i gave one to the sultan who mounted it in his sabre another to our holy father the pope who had it set in his tiara opposite to one nearly as large though not so fine given by the emperor napoleon to his predecessor pius seventh i kept the third for myself and i had it hollowed out which reduced its value but rendered it more commodious for the purpose i intended everyone looked at monte cristo with astonishment he spoke with so much simplicity that it was evident he spoke the truth or that he was mad however the sight of the emerald made them naturally inclined to the former belief and what did these two uh, sovereigns give you in exchange for these magnificent presents asked debray the sultan the liberty of a woman replied the count the pope the life of a man so that once in my life i have been as powerful as if heaven had brought me into the world on the steps of a throne and it was peppino you saved was it not cried morcerf it was for him that you obtained pardon perhaps returned the count smiling my dear count you have no idea what pleasure it gives me to hear you speak thus said morcerf i had announced you beforehand to my friends as an enchanter of the arabian nights a wizard of the middle ages 
but the Parisians are so subtle in paradox that they mistake for caprice of the imagination the most incontestable truths, when these truths do not form a part of their daily existence. For example, here is Debray, who reads, and Beauchamp, who prints. Every day a member of the jockey club has been stopped and robbed on the boulevard. Four persons have been assassinated in the Rue Saint-Denis or the Faubourg Saint-Germain. Ten, fifteen, or twenty thieves have been arrested in a café on the boulevard du Temple or in the Therme de Julien. And yet these same men deny the existence of the bandits in the Maremma, the Campagna di Romana, or the Pontine Marshes. Tell him yourself, and I was taken by bandits, and that without your generous intercession I should now have been sleeping in the catacombs of San Sebastian instead of receiving them in my humble abode in the rue du helder ah said monte cristo you promised me never to mention that circumstance it was not i who made that promise cried morcerf it must have been someone else whom you have rescued in the same manner and whom you have forgotten pray speak of it for i shall not only i trust relate the little i do know but also a great deal i do not know it seems to me returned the count smiling that you played a sufficiently important part to know as well as myself what happened well you promise me if i tell all i know to relate in your turn all that i do not know that is but fair replied monte cristo well said morcerf for three days i believed myself the object of the attentions of a mask whom i took for a descendant of tulia or popea while I was simply the object of the attentions of a contadina, and I say contadina to avoid saying peasant girl. What I know is that, like a fool, a greater fool than he of whom I spoke just now, I mistook this for a peasant girl, a young bandit of fifteen or sixteen with beardless chin and slim waist, and who, just as I was about to imprint a chaste salute on his lips, placed a pistol to my head, and aided by seven or eight others, led or rather dragged me to the catacombs of san sebastian where i found a highly educated brigand chief perusing caesar's commentaries and who deigned to leave off reading to inform me that unless the next morning before six o'clock four thousand piastres were paid into his account at his bankers at a quarter past six i should have ceased to exist the letter is still to be seen for it is in franz d'epinay's possession signed by me and with a postscript of monsieur luigi vampa this is all i know but i know not count how you contrive to inspire so much respect in the bandits of rome who ordinarily have so little respect for anything i assure you france and i were lost in admiration nothing more simple returned the count i had known the famous vampa for more than ten years when he was quite a child and only a shepherd i gave him a few gold pieces for showing me my way and he in order to repay me gave me a poniard the hilt of which he had carved with his own hand and which you may have seen in my collection of arms in after years whether he had forgotten this interchange of presents which ought to have cemented our friendship or whether he did not recollect me he sought to take me but on the contrary it was i who captured him and a dozen of his band i might have handed him over to roman justice which is somewhat expeditious and which would have been particularly so with him but i did nothing of the sort i suffered him and his band to depart with the condition that they should sin no more said beauchamp laughing i see they kept their promise no monsieur returned monte cristo upon the simple condition that they should respect myself and my friends perhaps what i am about to say may seem strange to you who are socialists and vaunt humanity and your duty to your neighbour but i never seek to protect a society which does not protect me and which i will even say generally occupies itself about me only to injure me and thus by giving them a low place in my esteem and preserving a neutrality towards them it is society and my neighbour who are indebted to me bravo cried chateau renaud you are the first man i have ever met sufficiently courageous to preach egotism bravo count bravo it is frank at least said morel 
but i am sure that the count does not regret having once deviated from the principles he has so boldly avowed how have i deviated from those principles monsieur asked monte cristo who could not help looking at morel with so much intensity that two or three times the young man had been unable to sustain that clear and piercing glance why it seems to me replied morel that in delivering monsieur de morcerf whom you did not know you did good to your neighbor and to society of which he is the brightest ornament said beauchamp drinking off a glass of champagne my dear count cried morcerf you are at fault you one of the most formidable logicians i know and you must see it clearly proved that instead of being an egotist you are a philanthropist ah you call yourself oriental a levantine maltese indian chinese your family name is monte cristo sinbad the sailor is your baptismal appellation and yet the first day you set foot in paris you instinctively display the greatest virtue or rather the chief defect of us eccentric parisian that is you assume the views you have not and conceal the virtues you possess my dear vicomte returned monte cristo i do not see in all i have done anything that merits either from you or these gentlemen the pretended eulogies i have received you were no stranger to me for i knew you from the time i gave up two rooms to you invited you to breakfast with me lent you one of my carriages witnessed the carnival in your company and saw with you from a window in the piazza del popolo the execution that affected you so much that you nearly fainted i will appeal to any of these gentlemen could i leave my guest in the hands of a hideous bandit as you term him besides you know i had the idea that you would introduce me into some of the paris salons when i came to france you might some time ago have looked upon this resolution as a vague project but to-day you see it was a reality and you must submit to it under penalty of breaking your word i will keep it returned morcerf but i fear that you will be much disappointed accustomed as you are to picturesque events and fantastic horizons amongst us you will not meet with any of these episodes with which your adventurous existence has so familiarized you our chimborazo is montmartre our himalaya is mount valerian our great desert is the plain of grenelle where they are now boring an artesian well to water the caravans we have plenty of thieves though not so many as is said but these thieves stand in far more dread of a policeman than a lord france is so prosaic and paris so civilized a city that you will not find in its eighty-five department i say eighty-five because i do not include corsica you will not find then in these eighty-five departments a single hill on which there is not a telegraph or a grotto in which the commissary of police has not put up a gas lamp there is but one service i can render you and for that i place myself entirely at your orders that is to present or make my friends present you everywhere besides you have no need of any one to introduce you with your name and your fortune and your talent monte cristo bowed with a somewhat ironical smile you can present yourself everywhere and be well received i can be useful in one way only if knowledge of parisian habits of the means of rendering yourself comfortable or of the bazaars can assist you may depend upon me to find you a fitting dwelling here i do not dare offer to share my apartments with you as i shared yours at rome i who do not profess egotism but am yet egotist par excellence for except myself these rooms would not hold a shadow more unless that shadow were uh, feminine ah said the count that is a most conjugal reservation i recollect that at rome you said something of a projected marriage may i congratulate you the affair is still in projection and he who says in projection means already decided said debray no replied morcerf my father is most anxious about it and i hope he long to introduce you if not to my wife at least to my betrothed mademoiselle eugenie d'anglars eugenie d'anglars said monte cristo 
tell me is not her father baron d'anglars yes returned morcerf a baron of a new creation what matter said monte cristo if he has rendered the state services which merit his distinction enormous ones answered beauchamp although in reality a liberal he negotiated a loan of six millions for charles x in eighteen twenty nine who made him a baron and chevalier of the legion of honor so that he wears the ribbon not as you would think in his waistcoat pocket but at his buttonhole ah interrupted morcerf laughing beauchamp beauchamp keep that for the corsair or the chiaravari but spare my future father-in-law before me then turning to monte cristo you just now spoke his name as if you knew the baron i do not know him returned monte cristo but i shall probably soon make his acquaintance for i have a credit opened with him by the house of richard and blount of london arstein and eskels of vienna and thompson and french at rome as he pronounced the two last names the count glanced at maximilian morel if the stranger expected to produce an effect on morel he was not mistaken maximilian started as if he had been electrified thompson and french said he do you know this house monsieur they are my bankers in the capital of the christian world returned the count quietly can my influence with them be of any service to you oh count you could assist me perhaps in researches which have been up to the present fruitless this house in past years did ours a great service and has i know not for what reason always denied having rendered us this service i shall be at your orders said monte cristo bowing but continued morcerf a propos of danglars we have strangely wandered from the subject we were speaking of a suitable habitation for the count of monte cristo come gentlemen let us all propose some place where shall we lodge this new guest in our great capital faubourg saint germain said chateau renaud the count will find them a charming hotel with a court and a garden bah chateau renaud returned the bray you only know your dull and gloomy faubourg saint germain do not pay any attention to him count live in the chaussee d'antin that's the real centre of paris boulevard de l'opera said beauchamp the second floor a house with a balcony the count will have his cushions of silver cloth brought here there and as he smokes his jibouk see all paris pass before him you have no idea then morel asked chateau renaud you do not propose anything oh yes returned the young man smiling on the contrary i have one but i expected the count would be tempted by one of the brilliant proposals made him yet as he has not replied to any of them i will venture to offer him a suite of apartments in a charming hotel in the pompadour style that my sister has inhabited for a year in the rue meslay you have a sister asked the count yes monsieur a most excellent sister married nearly nine years happy asked the count again as happy as it is permitted to a human creature to be replied maximilian she married the man she loved who remained faithful to us in our fallen fortunes emmanuel herbo monte cristo smiled imperceptibly i live there during my leave of absence continued maximilian and i shall be together with my brother-in-law emmanuel at the disposition of the count whenever he thinks fit to honor us one minute cried albert without giving monte cristo the time to reply take care you are going to immure a traveller simbad the sailor a man who comes to see paris you are going to make a patriarch of him oh no said morel my sister is five and twenty my brother-in-law is thirty they are gay young and happy besides the count will be in his own house and only see them when he thinks fit to do so thanks monsieur said monte cristo i shall content myself with being presented to your sister and her husband if you will do me the honor to introduce me but i cannot accept the offer of any of one of these gentlemen since my habitation is already prepared what cried morcerf you are then going to an hotel that will be very dull for you was i so badly lodged at rome said monte cristo smiling parbleu 
at rome you spent fifty thousand piastres in furnishing your apartments but i presume that you are not disposed to spend a similar sum every day it is not that which deterred me replied monte cristo but as i determined to have a house to myself i sent on my valet de chambre and he ought by this time to have bought the house and furnished it but you have then a valet de chambre who knows paris said beauchamp it is the first time he has ever been in paris he is black and cannot speak returned monte cristo it is ali cried albert in the midst of the general surprise yes ali himself my nubian mute whom you saw i think at rome certainly said morcerf i recollect him perfectly but how could you charge a nubian to purchase a house and a mute to furnish it he would do everything wrong undeceiver yourself monsieur replied monte cristo i am quite sure that on the contrary he will choose everything as i wish he knows my tastes my caprice my wants he has been here a week with the instinct of a hound hunting by himself he will arrange everything for me he knew that i should arrive to-day at ten o'clock he was waiting for me at nine at the barriere de fontainebleau he gave me this paper it contains the number of my new abode read it yourself and monte cristo passed a paper to albert ah that is really original said beauchamp and very princely added chateau renaud what do you not know your house asked debray no said monte cristo i told you i do not wish to be behind my time i dressed myself in the carriage and descended at the viscount's door the young men looked at each other they did not know if it was a comedy monte cristo was playing but every word he uttered had such an air of simplicity that it was impossible to suppose what he said was false besides why should he tell a falsehood we must content ourselves then said beauchamp with rendering the count all the little service in our power i in my quality of journalist open all the theatres to him thanks monsieur returned monte cristo my steward has orders to take a box at each theatre is your steward also a nubian asked debray no he is a countryman of yours if a corsican is a countryman of any one's but you know him monsieur de Montcerf. is it that excellent monsieur bertuccio who understands hiring windows so well yes you saw him the day i had the honour of receiving you he has been a soldier a smuggler in fact everything i would not be quite sure that he has not been mixed up with the police for some trifle a stab with a knife for instance and you have chosen this honest citizen for your steward said debray of how much does he rob you every year on my word replied the count not more than another i am sure he answers my purpose knows no impossibility and so i keep him then continued chateau renaud since you have an establishment a steward and a hotel in the champs elysees you only want a mistress albert smiled he thought of the fair greek he had seen in the count's box at the argentina and val theatres i have something better than that said monte cristo i have a slave you procure your mistresses from the opera the vaudeville or the variety i purchased mine at constantinople it cost me more but i have nothing to fear don't you forget replied debray laughing that we are francs by name and francs by nature as king charles said and that the moment she puts her boot in france your slave becomes free who will tell her the first person who sees her she only speaks romaic that is different but at least we shall see her said beauchamp or do you keep eunuchs as well as mutes oh no replied monte cristo i do not carry brutalism so far every one who surrounds me is free to quit me and when they leave me will no longer have any need of me or anyone else it is for that reason perhaps that they do not quit me they have long since passed to dessert and cigars my dear albert said debray rising it is half past two your guest is charming but you leave the best company to go into the worst sometimes 
i must return to the ministers i will tell him of the count and we shall soon know of who he is take care returned albert no one has been able to accomplish that oh we have three millions for our police it is true they are almost always spent beforehand but no matter we shall still have fifty thousand francs to spend for this purpose and when you know will you tell me i promise you au revoir albert gentlemen good morning as he left the room debray called out loudly my carriage bravo said beauchamp to albert i shall not go to the chamber but i have something better to offer my readers than a speech of monsieur danglars for heaven's sake beauchamp returned morcerf do not deprive me of the merit of introducing him everywhere is he not peculiar he is more than that replied chateau renaud he is one of the most extraordinary men i ever saw in my life are you coming morel directly i have given my card to the count who has promised to pay us a visit at rue melee numero quatorze be sure i shall not fail to do so returned the count bowing and maximilian morel left the room with the baron de chateau renaud leaving monte cristo alone with morcerf End of chapter 40。f o r t y one of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 41 The Presentation. When Albert found himself alone with Monte Cristo, my dear count said he allow me to commence my services as cicerone by showing you a specimen of a bachelor's apartment you who are accustomed to the palaces of italy can amuse yourself by calculating in how many square feet a young man who is not the worst lodged in paris can live as we pass from one room to another i will open the windows to let you breathe monte cristo had already seen the breakfast room and the salon on the ground floor albert led him first to his atelier which was as we have said his favorite apartment monte cristo quickly appreciated all that albert had collected here old cabinets japanese porcelain oriental stuffs venetian glass arms from all parts of the world everything was familiar to him and at first glance he recognized their date their country and their origin morcerf had expected he should be the guide on the contrary it was he who under the count's guidance followed a course of archaeology mineralogy and natural history they descended to the first floor albert led his guest into the salon the salon was filled with the works of modern artists there were landscapes by dupre with their long reeds and tall trees their lowing oxen and marvellous skies de la croix arabian cavaliers with their long white burnouses their shining belts their damasked arms their horses who tore each other with their teeth while their riders contended fiercely with their maces aquarelle of boulanger representing notre dame de paris with that vigour that makes the artist the rival of the poet there were paintings by diaz who makes his flowers more beautiful than flowers his sons more brilliant than the sun designs by de camp as vividly coloured as those of salvator rosa but more poetic pastels by giraud and muller representing children like angels and women with the features of a virgin sketches torn from the album of dozat's travels in the east that had been made in a few seconds on the saddle of a camel or beneath the dome of a mosque in a word all that modern art can give in exchange and as recompense for the art lost and gone with ages long since past albert expected to have something new this time to show to the traveller but to his great surprise the latter without seeking for the signatures many of which indeed were only initials named instantly the author of every picture in such a manner that it was easy to see that each name was not only known to him but that each style associated with it had been appreciated and studied by him from the salon they passed into the bedchamber it was a model of taste and simple elegance a single portrait signed by leopold robert shone in its carved and gilded frame 
this portrait attracted the count of monte cristo's attention for he made three rapid steps in the chamber and stopped suddenly before it it was the portrait of a young woman of five or six and twenty with a dark complexion and light and lustrous eyes veiled beneath long lashes she wore the picturesque costume of the catalan fisherwoman a red and black bodice and golden pins in her hair she was looking at the sea and her form was outlined on the blue ocean and sky the light was so faint in the room that albert did not perceive the pallor that spread itself over the count's visage or the nervous heaving of his chest and shoulders silence prevailed for an instant during which monte cristo gazed intently on the picture you have there a most charming mistress viscount said the count in a perfectly calm tone and this costume a ball costume doubtless becomes her admirably ah uh, monsieur returned albert i would never forgive you this mistake if you had seen another picture besides this you do not know my mother she it is whom you see here she had her portrait painted thus six or eight years ago this costume is a fancy one it appears and the resemblance is so great that i think i shall see my mother the same as she was in eighteen thirty the countess had this portrait painted during the count's absence she doubtless intended giving him an agreeable surprise but strange to say this portrait seemed to displease my father and the value of the picture which is as you see one of the best works of leopold robert could not overcome his dislike to it it is true between ourselves that Monsieur de Morcerf is one of the most assiduous peers at Luxembourg, a general renowned for theory, but a most mediocre amateur of art. It is different with my mother, who paints exceedingly well, and who, unwilling to part with so valuable a picture, gave it to me to put here, where it would be less likely to displease Monsieur de Morcerf, whose portrait, by Gros, I will also show you excuse my talking of family matters but as i shall have the honour of introducing you to the count i tell you this to prevent you making any allusions to this picture the picture seems to have a malign influence for my mother rarely comes here without looking at it and still more rarely does she look at it without weeping this disagreement is the only one that has ever taken place between the count and countess who are still as much united although married more than twenty years as on the first day of their wedding monte cristo glanced rapidly at albert as if to seek a hidden meaning in his words but it was evident the young man uttered them in the simplicity of his heart now said albert that you have seen all my treasures allow me to offer them to you unworthy as they are consider yourself as in your own house and to put yourself still more at your ease pray accompany me to the apartments of monsieur de morcerf he whom i wrote from rome an account of the services you rendered me and to whom i announced your promised visit and i may say that both the count and countess anxiously desire to thank you in person you are somewhat blasé i know and family scenes have not much effect on sinbad the sailor who has seen so many others however accept what i propose to you as an initiation into parisian life a life of politeness visiting and introductions monte cristo bowed without making any answer he accepted the offer without enthusiasm and without regret as one of those conventions of society which every gentleman looks upon as a duty albert summoned his servant and ordered him to acquaint monsieur and madame de morcerf of the arrival of the count of monte cristo albert followed him with the count when they arrived at the antechamber above the door was visible a shield which by its rich ornaments and its harmony with the rest of the furniture indicated the importance the owner attached to this blason monte cristo stopped and examined it attentively asia seven merlets or placed a bender said he these are doubtless your family arms except the knowledge of blasons that enables me to decipher them i am very ignorant of heraldry i a count of a fresh creation fabricated in tuscany by the aid of a commandery of st stephen and who would not have taken the trouble had i not been told that when you travel much it is necessary besides 
you must have something on the panels of your carriage to escape being searched by the custom-house officers excuse my putting such a question to you it is not indiscreet returned morcerf with the simplicity of conviction you have guessed rightly these are our arms that is those of my father but they are as you see joined to another shield which has a jewel a silver tower which are my mother's by her side i am spanish but the family of morcerf is french and i have heard one of the oldest of the south of france yes replied monte cristo these blasons approve of that almost all the armed pilgrims that went to the holy land took for their arms either a cross in honour of their mission or birds of passage in sign of the long voyage they were about to undertake and which they hoped to accomplish on the wings of faith one of your ancestors had joined the crusades and supposing it to be only that of saint louis that makes you mount to the thirteenth century which is tolerably ancient it is possible said morcerf my father has in his study a genealogical tree which will tell you all that and on which i made commentaries that would have greatly edified osier and jocor at present i no longer think of it and yet i must tell you that we are beginning to occupy ourselves greatly with these things under our popular government well then your government would do well to choose from the past something better than the things that i have noticed on your monuments and which have no heraldic meaning whatever as for you my count continued monte cristo to morcerf you are more fortunate than the government for your arms are really beautiful and speak to the imagination yes you are at once from provence and spain that explains if the portrait you showed me be like the dark hue i so much admired on the visage of the noble catalan it would have required the penetration of oedipus or the sphinx to have divined the irony the count concealed beneath these words apparently uttered with the greatest politeness morcerf thanked him with a smile and pushed open the door above which were his arms and which as we have said opened into the salon in the most conspicuous part of the salon was another portrait it was that of a man from five to eight and thirty in the uniform of a general officer wearing the double epaulet of heavy bullion that indicates superior rank the ribbon of the legion of honor around his neck which showed he was a commander and on the right breast the star of a grand officer of the order of the saviour and on the left that of the grand cross of charles III, which proved that the person represented by the picture had served in the wars of greece and spain or what was just the same thing as regarded decorations had fulfilled some diplomatic mission in the two countries monte cristo was engaged in examining this portrait with no less care than he had bestowed upon the other when another door opened and he found himself opposite to the count of morcerf in person he was a man of forty to forty-five years but he seemed at least fifty and his black moustache and eyebrows contrasted strangely with his almost white hair which was cut short in the military fashion he was dressed in plain clothes and wore at his buttonhole the ribbons of the different orders to which he belonged he entered with a tolerably dignified step and some little haste monte cristo saw him advance towards him without making a single step it seemed as if his feet were rooted to the ground and his eyes on the count of morcerf father said the young man i have the honor of presenting to you the count of monte cristo the generous friend whom i had the good fortune to meet in the critical situation of which i have told you you are most welcome monsieur said the count of morcerf saluting monte cristo with a smile and monsieur has rendered our house in preserving its only heir a service which ensures him our eternal gratitude as he said these words the count of morcerf pointed to a chair while he seated himself in another opposite the window monte cristo in taking the seat morcerf offered him placed himself in such a manner as to remain concealed in the shadow of the large velvet curtains and read on the careworn and livid features of the count a whole history of secret griefs written in each wrinkle time had planted there the countess said morcerf 
was at her toilet uh, when she was informed of the visit she was about to receive. She will, however, be in the salon in ten minutes. It is a great honour to me, returned Monte Cristo, to be thus on the first day of my arrival in Paris, brought in contact with a man whose merit equals his reputation, and to whom fortune has for once been equitable. But has she not still on the plains of Metidja, or in the mountains of Atlas, a martial staff to offer you? Oh, replied Morcerf, reddening slightly, I have left the service, monsieur, made a peer at the restoration, I served through the first campaign under the orders of Marshal Bourmont. I could, therefore, expect a higher rank, and who knows what might have happened had the elder branch remained on the throne. But the revolution of July was, it seems sufficiently glorious, to allow itself to be ungrateful, and it was so for all services that did not date from the imperial period. I tendered my resignation, for when you have gained your epaulets on the battlefield, you do not know how to manoeuvre on the slippery grounds of the salon. I have hung up my sword and cast myself into politics. I have devoted myself to industry. I study the useful arts. During the twenty years I served, I often wished to do so, but I had not the time." "'These are the ideas that render your nation superior to any other,' returned Monte Cristo. "'A gentleman of high birth, possessor of an ample fortune. "'You have consented to gain your promotion as an obscure soldier, step by step. "'This is uncommon. "'Then become general, peer of France, commander of the Legion of Honour. "'You consent to again commence a second apprenticeship, "'without any other hope of any other desire than that of one day becoming useful to your fellow creatures. This, indeed, is praiseworthy. Nay, more, it is sublime. Albert looked on and listened with astonishment. He was not used to see Monte Cristo give vent to such bursts of enthusiasm. Alas, continued the stranger, doubtless to dispel the slight cloud that covered Morcerf's brow, we do not act thus in Italy. We grow according to our race and our species, and we pursue the same lines, and often the same uselessness, all our lives. "'But, monsieur,' said the Count of Morcerf, "'for a man of your merit, Italy is not a country, and France opens her arms to receive you. Respond to her call. France will not, perhaps, be always ungrateful. She treats her children ill, but she always welcomes strangers.' "'Ah, father,' said Albert, with a smile, "'it is evident you do not know the Count of Monte Cristo. "'He despises all honours and contents himself with those written on his passport.' "'That is the most just remark,' replied the stranger. "'I have ever heard made concerning myself.' "'You have been free to choose your career,' observed the Count of Morcerf, with a sigh. "'And you have chosen the path strewed with flowers.' "'Precisely, monsieur,' replied Monte Cristo, with one of those smiles that a painter could never represent or a physiologist analyse. "'If I did not fear to fatigue you,' said the general, evidently charmed with the Count's manners, "'I would have taken you to the chamber. There is a debate very curious to those who are strangers to our modern senators.' "'I shall be most grateful, monsieur, if you will at some future time renew your offer. "'But I have been flattered with the hope of being introduced to the countess, and I will therefore wait.' "'Ah, here is my mother,' cried the Viscount. "'Monte Cristo turned round hastily, and saw Madame de Morcerf at the entrance of the salon, "'at the door opposite to that by which her husband had entered, pale and motionless.' When Monte Cristo turned around, she let fall her arm, which for some unknown reason had been resting on the gilded doorpost. She had been there some moments, and had heard the last words of the visitor. The latter rose and bowed to the countess, who inclined herself without speaking. "'Ah, good heavens, madame,' said the count, 
are you ill or is it the heat of the room that affects you are you ill mother cried the viscount springing towards her she thanked them both with a smile no returned she but i feel some emotion on seeing for the first time the man without whose intervention we should have been in tears and desolation monsieur continued the countess advancing with the majesty of a queen i owe to you the life of my son and for this i bless you now i thank you for the pleasure you give me in thus affording me the opportunity of thanking you as i have blessed you from the bottom of my heart the count bowed again but lower than before he was even paler than mercedes madame said he the count and yourself recompense too generously a simple action to save a man to spare a father's feelings or a mother's sensibility is not to do a good action but a simple deed of humanity at these words uttered with the most exquisite sweetness and politeness madame de morcerf replied it is very fortunate for my son monsieur that he found such a friend and i thank god that things are thus and mercedes raised her fine eyes to heaven with so fervent an expression of gratitude that the count fancied he saw tears in them monsieur de morcerf approached her madame said he i have already made my excuses to the count for quitting him and i pray you to do so also the sitting commences at two it is now three and i am to speak go then and monsieur and i will strive our best to forget your absence replied the countess with the same tone of deep feeling monsieur continued she turning to monte cristo will you do us the honor of passing the rest of the day with us believe me madam i feel most grateful for your kindness but i go out of my travelling carriage at your door this morning and i am ignorant how i am installed in paris which i scarcely know this is but a trifling inquietude i know but one that may be appreciated we shall have the pleasure another time said the countess you promise that monte cristo inclined himself without answering but the gesture might pass for assent i will not detain you monsieur continued the countess i would not have our gratitude become indiscreet or importunate my dear count said albert i will endeavour to return your politeness at rome and place my coupe at your disposal until your own be ready a thousand thanks for your kindness viscount returned the count of monte cristo but i suppose that monsieur bertuccio has suitably employed the four hours and a half i have given him and that i shall find a carriage of some sort ready at the door albert was used to the count's manner of proceeding he knew that like nero he was in search of the impossible and nothing astonished him but wishing to judge with his own eyes how far the count's orders had been executed he accompanied him to the door of the house monte cristo was not deceived as soon as he appeared in the count of morcerf's antechamber a footman the same who at rome had brought the count's card to the two young men and announced his visit sprang into the vestibule and when he arrived at the door the illustrious traveller found his carriage awaiting him it was a coop of collars building and with horses and harness for which drake had to the knowledge of all the lions of paris refused on the previous day seven hundred guineas monsieur said the count to albert i do not ask you to accompany me to my house as i can only show you a habitation fitted up in a hurry and i have as you know a reputation to keep as regards not being taken by surprise give me therefore one more day before i invite you i shall then be certain not to fall in my hospitality if you ask me for a day count i know what to anticipate it will not be a house i shall see but a palace you have decidedly some genius at your control ma foi spread that idea replied the count of monte cristo putting his foot on the velvet lined steps of his splendid carriage and that will be worth something to me among the ladies as he spoke he sprang into the vehicle the door was closed 
but not so rapidly that monte cristo failed to perceive the almost imperceptible movement which stirred the curtains of the apartment in which he had left madame de morcerf when albert returned to his mother he found her in the boudoir reclining in a large velvet armchair the whole room so obscure that only the shining spangle fastened here and there to the drapery and the angles of the gilded frames of the pictures showed with some degree of brightness in the gloom albert could not see the face of the countess as it was covered with a thin veil she had put on her head and which fell over her features in misty folds but it seemed to him as though her voice had altered he could distinguish amid the perfumes of the roses and the heliotropes in the flower stands the sharp and fragrant odor of volatile salts and he noticed in one of the chaste cups on the mantelpiece the countess's smelling bottle taken from its chagrin case and exclaimed in a tone of uneasiness as he entered my dear mother have you been ill during my absence no no albert but you know these roses tuberoses and orange flowers throw out first before one is used to them such violent perfumes then my dear mother said albert putting his hand to the bell they must be taken into the antechamber you are really ill and just now were so pale as you came into the room was i pale albert yes a pallor that suits you admirably mother but which did not the less alarm my father and myself did your father speak of it inquired mercedes eagerly no madame but do you not remember that he spoke of the fact to you yes i do remember replied the countess a servant entered summoned by albert's ring of the bell take these flowers into the anteroom or dressing-room said the viscount they make the countess ill the footman obeyed his orders a long pause ensued which lasted until all the flowers were removed what is this name of monte cristo inquired the countess when the servant had taken away the last vase of flowers is it a family name or the name of the estate or a simple title i believe mother it is merely a title the count purchased an island in the tuscan archipelago and as he told you to-day has founded a commandery you know the same thing was done for saint stephen of florence saint georges constantinian of parma and even for the order of malta except this he has no pretension to nobility and calls himself a chance count although the general opinion at rome is that the count is a man of very high distinction his manners are admirable said the countess at least as far as i could judge in the few minutes he remained there they are perfect mother so perfect that they surpass by far all i have known in the leading aristocracy of the three proudest nobilities of europe the english the spanish and the german the countess paused a moment then after a slight hesitation she resumed you have seen my dear albert i ask the question as a mother you have seen monsieur de monte cristo in his house you are quick-sighted have much knowledge of the world more tact than is usual at your age do you think the count is really what he appears to be what does he appear to be why you have just said a man of high distinction i told you my dear mother he was esteemed such but what is your opinion albert i must tell you that i have not come to any decided opinion respecting him but i think him a maltese i do not ask you of his origin but what he is ah what he is that is quite another thing i have seen so many remarkable things in him that if you would have me really say what i think i shall reply that i really do look upon him as one of byron's heroes whom misery has marked with a fatal brand some manfred some lara some werner one of those wrecks as it were of some ancient family who disinherited of their patrimony have achieved one by the force of their adventurous genius which has placed them above the laws of societe you say i say that monte cristo is an island in the midst of mediterranean without inhabitants or garrison the resort of smugglers of all nations and pirates of every flag 
who knows whether or not these industrious worthies do not pay to their feudal lord some dues for his protection that is possible said the countess reflecting never mind continued the young man smuggler or not you must agree mother dear as you have seen him that the count of monte cristo is a remarkable man who will have the greatest success in the salons of paris why this very morning in my rooms he made his entree amongst us by striking every man of us with amazement not even excepting chateau renaud and what do you suppose is the count's age inquired mercedes evidently attaching great importance to this question thirty-five or thirty-six mother so young it is impossible said mercedes replying at the same time to what albert said as well as to her own private reflection it is the truth however three or four times he has said to me and certainly without the slightest premeditation at such a period i was five years old at another ten years old at another twelve and i induced by curiosity which kept me alive to these details have compared the dates and never found him inaccurate the age of this singular man who is of no age is then i am certain thirty-five besides mother remark how vivid his eye how raven black his hair and his brow though so pale is free from wrinkles he is not only vigorous but also young the countess bent her head as if beneath a heavy wave of bitter thoughts and has this man displayed a friendship for you albert she asked with a nervous shudder i am inclined to think so and do you like him why he pleases me in spite of france d'epinay who tries to convince me that he is a being returned from the other world the countess shuddered albert she said in a voice which was altered by emotion i have always put on you your guard against new acquaintances now you are a man and are able to give me advice yet i repeat to you albert be prudent why my dear mother it is necessary in order to make your advice turn to account that i should know beforehand what i have to distrust the count never plays he only drinks pure water tinged with a little sherry and is so rich that he cannot without intending to laugh at me try to borrow money what then have i to fear from him you are right said the countess and my fears are weakness especially when directed against a man who has saved your life how did your father receive him albert it is necessary that we should be more than complaisant to the count monsieur de morcerf is sometimes occupied his business makes him reflective and he might without intending it nothing could be in better taste than my father's demeanour madame said albert nay more he is seemingly greatly flattered at two or three compliments which the count very skilfully and agreeably paid him with as much ease as if he had known him these thirty years each of these little tickling arrows must have pleased my father added albert with a laugh and thus they parted the best possible friends and monsieur de morcerf even wished to take him to the chamber to hear the speakers the countess made no reply she fell into so deep a reverie that her eyes gradually closed the young man standing up before her gazed upon her with that filial affection which is so tender and endearing with children whose mothers are still young and handsome then after seeing her eyes closed and hearing her breathe gently he believed she had dropped asleep and left the apartment on tiptoe closing the door after him with the utmost precaution this devil of a fellow he uttered shaking his head i said at the time you would create a sensation here and i measure his effect by an infallible thermometer my mother has noticed him and he must therefore perforce be remarkable he went down to the stables not without some slight annoyance when he remembered that the count of monte cristo had laid his hands on a turnout which sent his bays down to second place in the opinion of connoisseurs most decidedly said he 
men are not equal and i must beg my father to develop this theorem in the chamber of peers end of chapter 41《Chapter 42 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Chapter 42 Monsieur Bertuccio. Meanwhile, the Count had arrived at his house. It had taken him six minutes to perform the distance. But these six minutes were sufficient to induce twenty young men, who knew the price of the equipage they had been unable to purchase themselves, to put their horses in a gallop in order to see the rich foreigner who could afford to give twenty thousand francs apiece for his horses the house ali had chosen and which was to serve as a town residence to monte cristo was situated on the right hand as you ascend the champs elysees a thick clump of trees and shrubs rose in the centre and masked a portion of the front around this shrubbery two alleys like two arms extended right and left and formed a carriage drive from the iron gates to a double portico on every step of which stood a porcelain vase filled with flowers this house isolated from the rest had besides the main entrance another in the rue fontieu even before the coachman had hailed the concierge the massy gates rolled on their hinges they had seen the count coming and at paris as everywhere else he was served with a rapidity of lightning the coachman entered and traversed the half circle without slackening his speed and the gates were closed ere the wheels had ceased to sound on the gravel the carriage stopped at the left side of the portico two men presented themselves at the carriage window the one was ali who smiling with an expression of the most sincere joy seemed amply repaid by a mere look from monte cristo the other bowed respectfully and offered his arm to assist the count in descending thanks monsieur bertuccio said the count springing lightly up the three steps of the portico and the notary he is in the small salon excellency returned bertuccio and the cards i ordered to be engraved as soon as you knew the number of the house your excellency it is done already i have been myself to the best engraver of the palais royal who did the plate in my presence the first card struck off was taken according to your orders to the baron d'anglars rue de la chaussee d'autin numero set the others are on the mantelpiece of your excellency's bedroom good what o'clock is it four o'clock monte cristo gave his hat cane and gloves to the same french footman who had called his carriage at the count of morcerf's and then he passed into the small salon preceded by bertuccio who showed him the way these are but indifferent marbles in this antechamber said monte cristo i trust all this will soon be taken away bertuccio bowed as the steward had said the notary awaited him in the small salon he was a simple-looking lawyer's clerk elevated to the extraordinary dignity of a provincial scrivener you are the notary empowered to sell the country house that i wish to purchase monsieur asked monte cristo yes count returned the notary is the deed of sale ready yes count have you bought it here it is very well and where is this house that i purchase asked the count carelessly addressing himself half to bertuccio half to the notary the steward made a gesture that signified i do not know the notary looked at the count with astonishment what said he does not the count know where the house he purchased is situated no returned the count the count does not know how should i know i have arrived from cadiz this morning i have never before been at paris and it is the first time i have ever set foot in france ah this is different the house you purchased is at Auteuil. at these words bertuccio turned pale and where is Auteuil? asked the count close by here monsieur replied the notary a little beyond passy a charming situation in the heart of the bois de boulogne so near as that said the count but that is not in the country 
"'What made you choose a house at the gates of Paris, Monsieur Bertuccio?' "'I,' cried the steward, with a strange expression, "'His Excellency did not charge me to purchase this house. Uh, "'If His Excellency will recollect, uh, if he will think—' "'Ah, uh, true,' observed Monte Cristo. "'I recollect now. "'I read the advertisement in one of the papers, "'and was tempted by the false title, "'A Country House.' "'It is not yet too late,' cried Bertuccio uh, eagerly, "'and if Your Excellency will entrust me with the commission, "'I will find you a better at Enkin, or Fontenay or Rose, or at Bellevue.' "'Oh, no,' returned Monte Cristo negligently. "'Since I have this, I will keep it.' "'And you are quite right,' said the notary, who feared to lose his fee. "'It is a charming place, a well supplied with spring water and fine trees.' a comfortable habitation although abandoned for a long time without reckoning the furniture which although old is yet valuable now that old things are so much sought after i suppose the count has the tastes of the day to be sure returned monte cristo it is very convenient then it is more it is magnificent peste let us not lose such an opportunity returned monte cristo the deed if you please mr notary and he signed it rapidly after having first run his eye over that part of the deed in which were specified the situation of the house and the names of the proprietors bertuccio said he give fifty five thousand francs to monsieur the steward left the room with a faltering step and returned with a bundle of banknotes which the notary counted like a man who never gives a receipt for money until after he is sure it is all there and now demanded the count are all the forms complied with all oh, sir have you the keys they are in the hands of the concierge who takes care of the house but here is the order i have given him to install the count in his new possession very well said monte cristo made a sign with his hand to the notary which said i have no further need of you you may go but observed the honest notary the count is i think mistaken it is only fifty thousand francs everything included and your fee is included in the sum but have you not come from Auteuil here yes certainly well then it is but fair that you should be paid for your loss of time and trouble said the count and he made a gesture of polite dismissal the notary left the room backwards and bowing down to the ground it was the first time he had ever met a similar client see this gentleman out said the count to bertuccio and the steward followed the notary out of the room scarcely was the count alone when he drew from his pocket a book closed with a lock and opened it with a key which he wore round his neck and which never left him after having sought for a few minutes he stopped at a leaf which had several notes and compared them with the date deed of sale which lay on the table Auteuil, rue de la fontaine numero vingt huit it is indeed the same said he and now am i to rely upon an avowal extorted by religious or physical terror however in an hour i shall know all bertuccio cried he striking a light hammer with a pliant handle on a small gong bertuccio the steward appeared at the door monsieur bertuccio said the count did you never tell me that you had travelled in france in some parts of france yes excellency you know the environs of paris then no excellency no returned the steward with a sort of nervous trembling which monte cristo a connoisseur in all emotions rightly attributed to great disquietude it is unfortunate returned he that you have never visited the environs for i wish to see my new property this evening and had you gone with me you could have given me some useful information to Auteuil, cried bertuccio whose copper complexion became livid i, I go to Auteuil. well what is there surprising in that when i live at otoy you must come there as you belong to my service 
bertuccio hung down his head before the imperious look of his master and remained motionless without making any answer why what has happened to you are you going to make me ring a second time for the carriage asked monte cristo in the same tone that louis XIV pronounced the famous i have been almost obliged to wait bertuccio made but one bound to the antechamber and cried in a hoarse voice his excellency's horses monte cristo wrote two or three notes and as he sealed the last the steward appeared your excellency's carriage is at the door said he well take your hat and gloves returned monte cristo am i to accompany you your excellency cried bertuccio certainly you must give the orders for i intend residing at the house it was unexampled for a servant of the count's to dare to dispute an order of his so the steward without saying a word followed his master who got into the carriage and signed to him to follow which he did taking his place respectfully on the front seat end of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43 The House at Odeuil. Monte Cristo noticed, as they descended the staircase, that Bertuccio signed himself in the Corsican manner, that is, had formed the sign of the cross in the air with his thumb, and as he seated himself in the carriage, muttered a short prayer any one but a man of exhaustless thirst for knowledge would have had pity on seeing the steward's extraordinary repugnance for the count's projected drive without the walls but the count was too curious to let bertuccio off from this little journey in twenty minutes they were at auteuil the steward's emotion had continued to augment as they entered the village bertuccio crouched in the corner of the carriage began to examine with a feverish anxiety every house they passed tell them to stop at the rue de la fontaine numero vingt huit said the count fixing his eyes on the steward to whom he gave this order bertuccio's forehead was covered with perspiration however he obeyed and leaning out of the window he cried to the coachman rue de la fontaine numero vingt huit number twenty eight was situated at the extremity of the village during the drive night had set in and darkness gave the surroundings the artificial appearance of a scene on the stage the carriage stopped the footman sprang off the box and opened the door well said the count you do not get out monsieur bertuccio you are going to stay in the carriage then what are you thinking of this evening bertuccio sprang out and offered his shoulder to the count who this time leaned upon it as he descended the three steps of the carriage knock said the count and announce me bertuccio knocked the door opened and the concierge appeared what is it asked he it is your new master my good fellow said the footman and he held out to the concierge the notary's order the house is sold then demanded the concierge and this gentleman is coming to live here yes my friend returned the count and i will endeavour to give you no cause to regret your old master oh monsieur said the concierge i shall not have much cause to regret him for he came here but seldom it is five years since he was here last and he did well to sell the house for it did not bring him in anything at all what was the name of your old master said monte cristo the marquis of st Maron. ah i am sure he has not sold the house for what he gave for it the marquis of st Maron, returned the count the name is not unknown to me the marquis of st Maron, and he appeared to meditate an old gentleman continued the concierge a staunch follower of the bourbon he had an only daughter who married monsieur de villefort who had been the king's attorney at nîmes and afterwards at versailles monte cristo glanced at bertuccio who became whiter than the wall against which he leaned to prevent himself from falling and is not this daughter dead demanded monte cristo 
i fancy i have heard so yes monsieur one and twenty years ago and since then we have not seen the poor marquis three times thanks thanks said monte cristo judging from the steward's utter prostration that he could not stretch the cord further without danger of breaking it give me a light shall i accompany you monsieur no it is unnecessary bertuccio will show me a light and monte cristo accompanied these words by the gift of two gold pieces which produced a torrent of thanks and blessings from the concierge ah monsieur said he after having vainly searched on the mantelpiece and the shelves i have not got any candles take one of the carriage lamps bertuccio said the count and show me the apartments the steward obeyed in silence but it was easy to see from the manner in which the hand that held the light trembled how much it cost him to obey they went over a tolerably large ground floor a second floor consisted of a salon a bathroom and two bedrooms near one of the bedrooms they came to a winding staircase that led down to the garden ah here is a private staircase said the count that is convenient light me monsieur bertuccio it leads to the garden and pray how do you know that it ought to do so at least well let us be sure of that bertuccio sighed and went on first the stairs did indeed lead to the garden at the outer door the steward paused go on monsieur bertuccio said the count but he who was addressed stood there stupefied bewildered stunned his haggard eyes glanced around as if in search of the traces of some terrible event and with his clinched hands he seemed striving to shut out horrible recollections well insisted the count no no cried bertuccio settling down the lantern at the angle of the interior wall no monsieur it is impossible i can go no further what does this mean demanded the irresistible voice of monte cristo why you must see your excellency cried the steward that this is not natural that having a house to purchase you purchase it exactly at auteuil and that purchasing it at auteuil this house should be number twenty eight rue de la fontaine oh why did i not tell you all i am sure you would not have forced me to come i hoped your house would have been some other one than this as if there was not another house at auteuil than that of the assassination what what cried monte cristo stopping suddenly what words do you utter devil of a man corsican that you are always mysterious or superstitious come take the lantern and let us visit the garden you are not afraid of ghosts with me i hope bertuccio raised the lantern and obeyed the door as it opened disclosed a gloomy sky in which the moon strove vainly to struggle through a sea of clouds that covered her with billows of vapour which she illumined for an instant only to sink into obscurity the steward wished to turn to the left no no monsieur said monte cristo what is the use of following the alleys here is a beautiful lawn let us go on straight forwards bertuccio wiped the perspiration from his brow but obeyed however he continued to take the left hand monte cristo on the contrary took the right hand arrived near a clump of trees he stopped the steward could not restrain himself more monsieur move away i entreat you you are exactly on the spot what spot where he fell my dear monsieur bertuccio said monte cristo laughing control yourself we are not at sartene or at corte this is not the corsican arbor but an english garden badly kept i own but still you must not calumniate it for that monsieur i implore you do not stay here i think you are going mad bertuccio said the count coldly if that is the case i warn you i shall have you put in a lunatic asylum alas excellency returned bertuccio joining his hands and shaking his head in a manner that would have excited the count's laughter had not thoughts of a superior interest occupied him and rendered him attentive to the least revelation of this timorous conscience 
alas excellency the evil has arrived monsieur bertuccio said the count i am very glad to tell you that while you gesticulate you wring your hands and roll your eyes like a man possessed by a devil who will not leave him and i have always observed that the devil most obstinate to be expelled is a secret i knew you were a corsican i knew you were gloomy and always brooding over some old history of the vendetta and i overlooked that in italy because in italy those things are thought nothing of but in france they are considered in very bad taste there are gendarmes who occupy themselves with such affairs judges who condemn and scaffolds which avenge bertuccio clasped his hands and as in all these evolutions he did not let fall the lantern the light showed his pale and altered countenance monte cristo examined him with the same look that at rome he had bent upon the execution of andrea and then in a tone that made a shudder pass through the veins of the poor steward the abbe busoni then told me an untruth said he when after his journey in france in eighteen twenty nine he sent you to me with a letter of recommendation in which he enumerated all your valuable qualities well i shall write to the abbe i shall hold him responsible for his protege's misconduct and i shall soon know all about this assassination only i warn you that when i reside in a country i conform to all its code and i have no wish to put myself within the compass of the french laws for your sake oh do not do that excellency i have always served you faithfully cried bertuccio in despair i have always been an honest man and as far as lay in my power i have done good i do not deny it returned the count but why are you thus agitated it is a bad sign a quiet conscience does not occasion such paleness in the cheeks and such fever in the hands of a man but your excellency replied bertuccio hesitatingly did not the abbe busoni who heard my confession in the prison at nimes tell you that i had a heavy burden upon my conscience yes but as he said you would make an excellent steward i concluded you had stolen that was all oh your excellency returned bertuccio in deep contempt or as you are a corsican that you had been unable to resist the desire of making a stiff as you call it yes my good master cried bertuccio casting himself at the count's feet it was simply vengeance nothing else i understand that but i do not understand that what it is that galvanizes you in this manner but monsieur it is very natural returned bertuccio since it was in this house that my vengeance was accomplished what my house oh your excellency it was not yours then whose then the marquis de saint meran i think the concierge said what had you to revenge on the marquis de saint meran oh it was not on him monsieur it was on another that is strange returned monte cristo seeming to yield to his reflections that you should find yourself without any preparation in a house where the event happened that causes you so much remorse monsieur said the steward it is fatality i am sure first you purchase a house at auteuil this house is the one where i have committed an assassination you descend to the garden by the same staircase by which he descended you stop at the spot where he received the blow and two paces farther in the grave in which he had just buried his child this is not chance for chance in this case is too much like providence well amiable corsican let us suppose it is providence i always suppose anything people please and besides you must concede something to diseased minds come collect yourself and tell me all i have related it but once and that was to the abbe busoni such things continued bertuccio shaking his head are only related under the seal of confession then said the count i refer you to your confessor turn chartreux or trappist and relate your secrets 
but as for me i do not like any one who is alarmed by such phantasmas and i do not choose that my servants should be afraid to walk in the garden of an evening i confess i am not very desirous of a visit from the commissary of police for in italy justice is only paid when silent in france she is paid only when she speaks pest i thought you somewhat corsican a great deal smuggler and an excellent steward but i see you have other strings to your bow you are no longer in my service monsieur bertuccio oh your excellency your excellency cried the steward struck with terror at this threat if that is the only reason i cannot remain in your service i will tell all for if i quit you it will only be to go to the scaffold that is different replied monte cristo but if you intend to tell an untruth reflect it were better not to speak at all no monsieur i swear to you by my hopes of salvation i will tell you all for the abbe busoni himself only knew a part of my secret but i pray you go away from that plane tree the moon is just bursting through the clouds and there standing where you do and wrapped in that cloak that conceals your figure you remind me of monsieur de villefort what cried monte cristo it was monsieur de villefort your excellency knows him the former royal attorney at nîmes yes who married the marquis of saint marin's daughter yes who enjoyed the reputation of being the most severe the most upright the most rigid magistrate on the bench well monsieur said bertuccio this man with this spotless reputation well was a villain bah replied monte cristo impossible it is as i tell you oh, really said monte cristo have you proof of this i had it and you have lost it how stupid yes but by careful search it might be recovered really returned the count relate it to me for it begins to interest me and the count humming an air from lucia went to sit down on a bench while bertuccio followed him collecting his thoughts bertuccio remained standing before him end of chapter 43「Chapter 44. The Vendetta "'At what point shall I begin my story, Your Excellency?' asked Bertuccio. "'Where you please,' returned Monte Cristo, "'since I know nothing at all of it. "'I thought the Abbe Busoni had told Your Excellency.' some particulars doubtless but that is seven or eight years ago and i have forgotten them then i can speak without fear of tiring your excellency go on monsieur bertuccio you will supply the want of the evening papers the story begins in eighteen fifteen ah said monte cristo eighteen fifteen is not yesterday no monsieur and yet i recollect all things as clearly as if they had happened but then i had a brother an elder brother who was in the service of the emperor he had become lieutenant in a regiment composed entirely of corsicans this brother was my only friend we became orphans i at five he at eighteen he brought me up as if i had been his son and in eighteen fourteen he married when the emperor returned from the island of elba my brother instantly joined the army was slightly wounded at waterloo and retired with the army beyond the loire but that is the history of the hundred days monsieur bertuccio said the count unless i am mistaken it has already been written excuse me excellency but these details are necessary and you promised to be patient go on i will keep my word one day we received a letter i should tell you that we lived in a little village of rogliano at the extremity of cap corso this letter was from my brother 
he told us that the army was disbanded and that he should return by chateauroux clermont ferrand le puy and nîmes and if i had any money he prayed me to leave it for him at nîmes with an innkeeper with whom i had dealings in the smuggling line said monte cristo hey your excellency everyone must live certainly go on i loved my brother tenderly as i told your excellency and i resolved not to send the money but to take it to him myself i possessed a thousand franc i left five hundred with assunta my sister-in-law and with the other five hundred i set off for nîmes it was easy to do so and as i had my boat and a lading to take in at sea everything favoured my project but after we had taken in our cargo the wind became contrary so that we were four or five days without being able to enter the rhone at last however we succeeded and worked up to arles i left the boat between bellegarde and beaucaire and took the road to nîmes we are getting to the story now yes your excellency excuse me but as you will see i only tell you what is absolutely necessary just at this time the famous massacres took place in the south of france three brigands called Frestaion, trufemi and grafan publicly assassinated everybody whom they suspected of bonapartism you have doubtless heard of these massacres your excellency vaguely i was far from france at that period go on as i entered nîmes i literally waded in blood at every step you encountered dead bodies and bands of murderers who killed plundered and burned at the sight of the slaughter and devastation i became terrified not for myself for i a simple corsican fisherman had nothing to fear on the contrary that time was most favorable for us smugglers but for my brother a soldier of the empire returning from the army of the loire with his uniform and his epaulets there was everything to apprehend i hastened to the innkeeper my misgivings had been but too true my brother had arrived the previous evening at nîmes and at the very door of the house where he was about to demand hospitality he had been assassinated i did all in my power to discover the murderers but no one does tell me their names so much were they dreaded i even thought of that french justice of which i had heard so much and which feared nothing and i went to the king's attorney and this king's attorney was named villefort asked monte cristo carelessly yes your excellency he came from marseilles where he had been deputy procureur his zeal had procured him advancement and he was said to be one of the first who had informed the government of the departure from the island of elba then said monte cristo you went to him monsieur i said my brother was assassinated yesterday in the streets of nîmes i know not by whom but it is your duty to find out you are the representative of justice here and it is for justice to avenge those she has been unable to protect who was your brother he asked a lieutenant in the corsican battalion a soldier of the usurper then a soldier of the french army well replied he he has smitten with the sword and he has perished by the sword you are mistaken monsieur i replied he has perished by the poniard what do you want me to do asked the magistrate i have already told you avenge him on whom on his murderers how should i know who they are order them to be sought for why your brother has been involved in a quarrel and killed in a duel all these old soldiers commit excesses which were tolerated in the time of the emperor but which are not suffered now for the people here do not like soldiers of such disorderly conduct monsieur i replied it is not for myself that i entreat your interference i should grieve for him or avenge him but my poor brother had a wife and were anything to happen to me the poor creature would perish from want 
for my brother's pay alone kept her pray try and obtain a small government pension for her every revolution has its catastrophes returned the monsieur de villefort your brother has been the victim of this it is a misfortune and government owes nothing to his family if we are to judge by all the vengeance that the followers of the usurper exercised on the partisans of the king when in their turn they were in power your brother would be today in all probability condemned to death what has happened is quite natural and in conformity with the law of reprisals what cried i do you a magistrate speak thus to me all oh, those corsicans are mad on my honour replied monsieur de villefort they fancy that their countryman is still emperor you have mistaken the time you should have told me this two months ago it is too late now go now at once or i shall have you put out i looked at him an instant to see if there was anything to hope from further entreaty but he was a man of stone i approached him and said in a low voice well since you know the corsican so well you know that they always keep their word you think that it was a good deed to kill my brother who was a bonapartist because you are a royalist well i who am a bonapartist also declare one thing to you which is that i will kill you from this moment i declare the vendetta against you so protect yourself as well as you can for the next time we meet your last hour has come and before he had recovered from his surprise i opened the door and left the room well well said monte cristo such an innocent looking person as you are to do these things monsieur bertuccio and to a king's attorney at that but did he know what was meant by the terrible word vendetta he knew so well that from that moment he shut himself in his house and never went out unattended seeking me high and low fortunately i was so well concealed that he could not find me then he became alarmed and dared not stay any longer at nîmes so he solicited a change of residence and as he was in reality very influential he was nominated to versailles but as you know a corsican who has sworn to avenge himself cares not for distance so his carriage fast as it went was never above a half a day's journey before me who followed him on foot the most important thing was not to kill him only for i had an opportunity of doing so a hundred times but to kill him without being discovered at least without being arrested i no longer belonged to myself for i had my sister-in-law to protect and provide for three months i watched monsieur de villefort for three months he took not a step out of doors without my following him at length i discovered that he went mysteriously to auteuil i followed him thither and i saw him enter the house where we now are only instead of entering by the great door that looks into the street he came on horseback or in his carriage left the one or the other at the little inn and entered by the gate you see there monte cristo made a sign with his head to show that he could discern in the darkness the door to which bertuccio alluded as i had nothing more to do at versailles i went to auteuil and gained all the information i could if i wished to surprise him it was evident this was the spot to lie in wait for him the house belonged as the concierge informed your excellency to monsieur de saint meran villefort's father-in-law monsieur de saint meran lived at marseilles so that this country house was useless to him and it was reported to be let to a young widow known only by the name of the baroness one evening as i was looking over the wall i saw a young and handsome woman who was walking alone in that garden which was not overlooked by any windows and i guessed that she was awaiting monsieur de villefort when she was sufficiently near for me to distinguish her features i saw she was from eighteen to nineteen 
tall and very fair as she had a loose muslin dress on and as nothing concealed her figure i saw she would ere long become a mother a few moments after the little door was opened and a man entered the young woman hastened to meet him they threw themselves into each other's arms embraced tenderly and returned together in the house the man was monsieur de villefort i fully believed that when he went out in the night he would be forced to traverse the whole of the garden alone and asked the count did you ever know the name of this woman no excellency returned bertuccio you will see that i had no time to learn it go on that evening continued bertuccio i could have killed the procureur but as i was not sufficiently acquainted with the neighborhood i was fearful of not killing him on the spot and that if his cries were overheard i might be taken so i put it off until the next occasion and in order that nothing should escape me i took a chamber looking into the street bordered by the wall of the garden three days after about seven o'clock in the evening i saw a servant on horseback leave the house at full gallop and take the road to sevres i concluded that he was going to versailles and i was not deceived three hours later the man returned covered with dust his errand was performed and two minutes after another man on foot muffled in a mantle opened the little door of the garden which he closed after him i descended rapidly although i had not seen villefort's face i recognized him by the beating of my heart i crossed the street and stopped at a post placed at the angle of the wall and by means of which i had once before looked onto the garden this time i did not content myself with looking but i took my knife out of my pocket felt that the point was sharp and sprang over the wall my first care was to run to the door he had left the key in it taking the simple precaution of turning it twice in the lock nothing then preventing my escape by this means i examined the grounds the garden was long and narrow a stretch of smooth turf extended down the middle and at the corners were clumps of trees with thick and massy foliage that made a background for the shrubs and flowers in order to go from the door to the house or from the house to the door monsieur de villefort would be obliged to pass by one of these clumps of trees it was the end of september the wind blew violently the faint glimpses of the pale moon hidden momentarily by masses of dark clouds that were sweeping across the sky whitened the gravel walks that led to the house but were unable to pierce the obscurity of the thick shrubberies in which a man could conceal himself without any fear of discovery i hid myself in the one nearest to the path villefort must take and scarcely was i there when amidst the gust of wind i fancied i heard groans but you know or rather you do not know your excellency that he who is about to commit an assassination fancies that he hears low cries perpetually ringing in his ears two hours passed thus during which i imagined i heard moans repeatedly midnight struck as the last stroke died away i saw a faint light shine through the windows of the private staircase by which we have just descended the door opened and the man in the mantle reappeared the terrible moment had come but i had so long been prepared for it that my heart did not fail in the least i drew my knife from my pocket again opened it and made ready to strike the man in the mantle advanced towards me but as he drew near i saw that he had a weapon in his hand i was afraid not of a struggle but of a failure when he was only a few paces from me i saw that what i had taken for a weapon was only a spade i was still unable to divine for what reason a monsieur de villefort had this spade in his hands when he stopped close to the thicket where i was glanced around and began to dig a hole in the earth i then perceived 
that he was hiding something under his mantle which he laid on the grass in order to dig more freely then i confess curiosity mingled with hatred i wished to see what villefort was going to do there and i remained motionless holding my breath then an idea crossed my mind which was confirmed when i saw the procureur lift from under his mantle a box two feet long and six or eight inches deep i let him place the box in the hole he had made then while he stamped with his feet to remove all traces of his occupation i rushed on him and plunged my knife into his breast exclaiming i am giovanni bertuccio thy death for my brothers thy treasure for his widow thou seest that my vengeance is more complete than i had hoped i know not if he heard these words i think he did not for he fell without a cry i felt his blood gush over my face but i was intoxicated i was delirious and the blood refreshed instead of burning me in a second i had disinterred the box then that it might not be known i had done so i filled up the hole threw the spade over the wall and rushed through the door which i double locked carrying off the key ah said monte cristo it seems to me this was nothing but murder and robbery no your excellency returned bertuccio it was a vendetta followed by restitution and was the sum a large one it was not money ah i recollect replied the count did you not say something of an infant yes excellency i hastened to the river sat down on the bank and with my knife forced open the lock of the box in a fine linen cloth was wrapped a new-born child its purple visage and its violet colored hands showed that it had perished from suffocation but as it was not yet cold i hesitated to throw it into the water that ran at my feet after a moment i fancied that i felt a slight pulsation of the heart and as i had been assistant at the hospital at bastia i did what a doctor would have done i inflated the lungs by blowing air into them and at the expiration of a quarter of an hour it began to breathe and cried feebly in my turn i uttered a cry but a cry of joy god has not cursed me then i cried since he permits me to save the life of a human creature in exchange for the life i have taken away and what did you do with the child asked monte cristo it was an embarrassing load for a man seeking to escape i had not for a moment the idea of keeping it but i knew that at paris there was an asylum where they received such creatures as i passed the city gates i declared that i had found the child on the road and i inquired where the asylum was the box confirmed my statement the linen proved that the infant belonged to wealthy parents the blood with which i was covered might have proceeded from the child as well as from any one else no objection was raised but they pointed out the asylum which was situated at the upper end of the rue d'enfer and after having taken the precaution of cutting the linen in two pieces so that one of the two letters which marked it was on the piece wrapped around the child while the other remained in my possession i rang the bell and fled with all speed a fortnight after i was at rogliano and i said to assunta console thyself sister israel is dead but he is avenged she demanded what i meant and when i had told her all giovanni said she you should have brought this child with you we would have replaced the parents it was lost have called it benedetto and then in consequence of this good action god would have blessed us in reply i gave her the half of the linen i had kept in order to reclaim him if we became rich what letters were marked on the linen said monte cristo an h and an n surmounted by a baron's coronet by heaven monsieur bertuccio you make use of heraldic terms 
"'Where did you study heraldry?' "'In your service, Excellency, where everything is learned.' "'Go on. I am curious to know two things.' "'What are they, Your Excellency?' "'What became of this little boy? For I think you told me it was a boy, Monsieur Vettuccio. "'No, Excellency, I do not recollect telling you that.' "'I thought you did. I must have been a mistaken.' no you were not for it was in reality a little boy but your excellency wished to know two things what was the second the second was the crime of which you are accused when you asked for a confessor and the abbe busoni came to visit you at your request in the prison at nimes the story will be very long excellency what matter you know i take but little sleep and i do not suppose you are very much inclined for it either bertuccio bowed and resumed his story partly to drown the recollections of the past that haunted me partly to supply the wants of the poor widow i eagerly returned to my trade of smuggler which had become more easy since that relaxation of the laws which always follows a revolution the southern districts were ill-watched in particular in consequence of the disturbances that were perpetually breaking out in avignon nimes or ouse we profited by this respite on the part of the government to make friends everywhere since my brother's assassination in the streets of nimes i had never entered the town the result was that the innkeeper with whom we were connected seeing we would no longer come to him was forced to come to us and had established a branch to his inn on the road from Belgarde to Beaucaire, at the sign of the Pont du Gard. We had thus, at Egmort, Martigues, or Bouc, a dozen places where we left our goods, and where, in case of necessity, we concealed ourselves from the gendarmes and custom house officers. Smuggling is a profitable trade when a certain degree of vigor and intelligence is employed. As for myself, brought up in the mountains i had a double motive for fearing the gendarme and custom-house officers as my appearance before the judges would cause an inquiry and an inquiry always looks back into the past and in my past life they might find something far more grave than the selling of smuggled cigars or barrels of brandy without a permit so preferring death to capture i accomplished the most astonishing deeds and which more than once showed me that the too great care we took of our bodies is the only obstacle to the success of those projects which require rapid decision and vigorous and determined execution in reality when you have once devoted your life to your enterprises you are no longer the equal of other men or rather other men are no longer your equals and whosoever has taken this resolution feels his strength and resources doubled philosophy monsieur bertuccio interrupted the count you have done a little of everything in your life oh excellency no no but a philosophy at half past ten at night is somewhat late yet i have no other observation to make for what you say is correct which is more than can be said for all philosophy my journeys became more and more extensive and more productive Asunta took care of all, and our little fortune increased. One day, as I was setting off on an expedition, Go, said she, at your return I will give you a surprise. I questioned her, but in vain she would tell me nothing, and I departed. Our expedition lasted nearly six weeks. We had been to Lucca to take in oil, to Leghorn for English cottons, and we ran out cargo without opposition and returned home full of joy when i entered the house the first thing i beheld in the middle of assunta's chamber was a cradle that might be called sumptuous compared with the rest of the furniture and in it a baby seven or eight months old i uttered a cry of joy the only moments of sadness i had known since the assassination of the procureur were caused by the recollection that I had abandoned this child. For the assassination itself, I had never felt any remorse. Poor Assunta had guessed all. 
she had profited by my absence and furnished with the half of the linen and having written down the day and hour at which i had deposited the child at the asylum had set off for paris and had reclaimed it no objection was raised and the infant was given up to her ah i confess your excellency when i saw this poor creature sleeping peacefully in its cradle i felt my eyes filled with tears ah santa cried i you are an excellent woman and heaven will bless you this said monte cristo is less correct than your philosophy it is only faith alas your excellency is right replied bertuccio and god made this infant the instrument of our punishment never did a perverse nature declare itself more prematurely and yet it was not owing to any fault in his bringing up he was a most lovely child with large blue eyes of that deep color that harmonizes so well with the blonde complexion only his hair which was too light gave his face a most singular expression and added to the vivacity of his look and the malice of his smile unfortunately there is a proverb which says that red is either altogether good or altogether bad the proverb was but too correct as regarded benedetto and even in his infancy he manifested the worst disposition it is true that the indulgence of his foster mother encouraged him this child for whom my poor sister would go to the town five or six leagues off to purchase the earliest fruits and the most tempting sweetmeats preferred to palmer grapes or genoese preserves the chestnuts stolen from a neighbor's orchard or the dried apples in his loft when he could eat as well as the nuts and apples that grew in the garden one day when benedetto was about five or six our neighbor vasilo who according to the custom of the country never locked up his purse or his valuables for as your excellency knows there are no thieves in corsica complained that he had lost a louis out of his purse we thought he must have made a mistake in counting his money but he persisted in the accuracy of his statement one day benedetto who had been gone from the house since morning to our great anxiety did not return until late in the evening dragging a monkey after him which he said he had found chained to the foot of a tree for more than a month the mischievous child who knew not what to wish for had taken it into his head to have a monkey a boatman who had passed by rogliano and who had several of these animals whose tricks had greatly diverted him had doubtless suggested this idea to him monkeys are not found in our woods chained to trees said i confess how you obtained the animal benedetto maintained the truth of what he had said and accompanied it with details that did more honor to his imagination than to his veracity i became angry he began to laugh i threatened to strike him and he made two steps backwards you cannot beat me said he you have no right for you are not my father we never knew who had revealed this fatal secret which we had so carefully concealed from him however it was this answer in which the child's whole character revealed itself that almost terrified me and my arm fell without touching him the boy triumphed and his victory rendered him so audacious that all the money of assunta whose affection for him seemed to increase as he became more unworthy of it was spent in caprice she knew not how to contend against and follies she had not the courage to prevent when i was at rogliano everything went on properly but no sooner was my back turned than benedetto became master and everything went ill when he was only eleven he chose his companions from among the young men of eighteen or twenty the worst characters in bastia or indeed in corsica and they had already for some mischievous pranks been several times threatened with a prosecution i became alarmed as any prosecution might be attended with serious consequences i was compelled at this period to leave corsica on an important expedition i reflected for a long time and with the hope of averting some impending misfortune 
I resolved that Benedetto should accompany me. I hoped that the active and laborious life of a smuggler, with the severe discipline on board, would have a salutary effect on his character, which was now well nigh, if not quite, corrupt. I spoke to Benedetto alone, and proposed to him to accompany me, endeavouring to tempt him by all the promises most likely to dazzle the imagination of a child of twelve. He heard me patiently, and when he had finished, burst out laughing. "'Are you mad, uncle?' He called me this name when he was in good humour. "'Do you think I am going to change the life I lead for your mode of existence, my agreeable indolence, for the hard and precarious toil you impose on yourself, exposed to the bitter frost at night, and the scorching heat by day, compelled to conceal yourself, and when you are perceived, receive a volley of bullets, all to earn a paltry sum? Why, I have as much money as I want. Mother Asanta always furnishes me when I ask for it. You see that I should be a fool to accept your offer. The arguments and his audacity perfectly stupefied me. Benedetto rejoined his associates, and I saw him from a distance point me out to them as a fool. Sweet child, murmured Monte Cristo. Oh, had he been my own son, replied Bertuccio, or even my nephew, I would have brought him back to the right road, for the knowledge that you are doing your duty gives you strength. But the idea that I was striking a child whose father I had killed made it impossible for me to punish him. I gave my sister, who constantly defended the unfortunate boy, good advice, and as she confessed that she had several times missed money to a considerable amount, I showed her a safe place in which to conceal our little treasure for the future. My mind was already made up. Benedetto could read, write, and cipher perfectly, for when the fit seized him, he learned more in a day than others in a week. My intention was to enter him as a clerk in some ship, and without letting him know anything of my plan, to convey him some morning on board. By this means his future treatment would depend upon his own conduct. I set off for France, after having fixed upon the plan. Our cargo was to be landed in the Gulf of Lyon, and this was a difficult thing to do, because it was then the year 1829. The most perfect tranquillity was restored, and the vigilance of the custom-house officers was redoubled, and their strictness was increased at this time, in consequence of the fair at Beaucaire. Our expedition made a favourable beginning. We anchored our vessel, which had a double hold, where our goods were concealed amidst a number of other vessels that bordered the banks of the Rhone from Beaucaire to Arles. On our arrival we began to discharge our cargo in the night, and to convey it into the town, by the help of the innkeeper with whom we were connected. Whether success rendered us imprudent, or whether we were betrayed, I know not, but one evening about five o'clock our little cabin-boy came breathlessly to inform us that he had seen a detachment of custom-house officers advancing in our direction. It was not their proximity that alarmed us, for detachments were constantly patrolling along the banks of the Rhone, but the care, according to the boy's account, that they took to avoid being seen. In an instant we were on the alert, but it was too late. Our vessel was surrounded, and amongst the custom-house officers I observed several gendarmes, and as terrified at the sight of their uniforms as I was brave at the sight of any other, I sprang into the hold, opened a port, and dropped into the river, dived and only rose at intervals to breathe, until I reached a ditch that had recently been made from the Rhone to the canal that runs from Beaucaire to Aigues-Mortes. I was now safe, for I could swim along the ditch without being seen, and I reached the canal in safety. I had designedly taken this direction. I have already told your excellency of an innkeeper from Nîmes, who had set up a little tavern on the road from Belgarde to Beaucaire. Yes, said Monte Cristo, I perfectly recollect him. I think he was your colleague. Precisely, answered Bertuccio but he had seven or eight years before this period sold his establishment to a tailor at Marseilles,
who, having almost ruined himself in his old trade, wished to make his fortune in another. Of course, we made the same arrangements with the new landlord that we had with the old, and it was of this man that I intended to ask shelter. "'What was his name?' inquired the Count, who seemed to become somewhat interested in Bertuccio's story. "'Gaspar Caderousse. He had married a woman from the village of Carconte, and whom we did not know by any other name than that of her village. She was suffering from malarial fever, and seemed dying by inches. As for her husband, he was a strapping fellow of forty or five and forty, who had more than once, in time of danger, given ample proof of his presence of mind and courage. "'And you say,' interrupted Monte Cristo, "'that this took place towards the year 1829, Your Excellency. In what month? June. The beginning or the end? The evening of the third. Ah, said Monte Cristo, the evening of the third of June, 1829. Go on. It was from Caderousse that I intended demanding shelter, and as we never entered by the door that opened on to the road, I resolved not to break through the rule, so climbing over the garden hedge, I crept amongst the olive and wild fig trees, and fearing that Caderousse might have some guest, I entered a kind of shed, in which I had often passed the night, and which was only separated from the inn by a partition in which holes had been made, in order to enable us to watch an opportunity of announcing our presence. My intention was, if Caderousse was alone, to acquaint him with my presence, finish the meal the custom-house officers had interrupted, and profit by the threatened storm to return to the Rhone, and ascertain the state of our vessel and its crew. I stepped into the shed, and it was fortunate I did so, for at that moment Caderousse entered with a stranger. I waited patiently, not to overhear what they said, but because I could do nothing else besides. The same thing had occurred often before. The man who was with Caderousse was evidently a stranger to the south of France. He was one of those merchants who came to sell jewellery at the Beaucaire Fair, and who during the month the fair lasts, and during which there is so great an influx of merchants and customers from all parts of Europe, often have dealings to the amount of one hundred thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand francs. Caderousse entered hastily. Then, seeing that the room was as usual empty, and only guarded by the dog, he called to his wife. "'Hello, Carcante,' said he. "'The worthy priest has not deceived us. The diamond is real.' An exclamation of joy was heard, and the staircase creaked beneath a feeble step. "'What do you say?' asked his wife, pale as a death. "'I say that the diamond is real, and that this gentleman, one of the first jewellers of Paris, will give us fifty thousand francs for it, only in order to satisfy himself that it really belongs to us. He wishes you to relate to him, as I have done already, the miraculous manner in which the diamond came into our possession. In the meantime, please to sit down, monsieur.' and I will fetch you some refreshment. The jeweller examined attentively the interior of the inn, and the apparent poverty of the persons who were about to sell him a diamond that seems to have come from the casket of a prince. "'Relate your story, madame,' said he, wishing, no doubt, to profit by the absence of the husband, so that the latter could not influence the wife's story, to see if the two recitals tallied. Oh, returned she, it was a gift from heaven. My husband was a great friend in 1814 or 1815 of a sailor named Edmond Dante. This poor fellow, whom Caderousse had forgotten, had not forgotten him, and at his death he bequeathed this diamond to him. But how did you obtain it? asked the jeweller. Had he not before he was imprisoned? No, monsieur, but it appears that in prison he made the acquaintance of a rich Englishman, and as in prison he fell sick, and Dante took the same care of him as if he had been his brother. The Englishman, 
when you are set free, gave this stone to Dante, who, less fortunate, died, and in his turn left it to us, and charged the excellent abbe, who was here this morning to deliver it. The same story, muttered the jeweller, and improbable as it seemed at first, it may be true. There is only the price we are not agreed about. How not agreed about? said Caderousse. I thought we agreed for the price I asked. That is, replied the jeweller, I offered the forty thousand francs. Forty thousand? cried La Carconte. We will not part with it for that sum. The abbe told us it was worth fifty thousand without the setting. What was the abbe's name? asked the indefatigable questioner. The abbe Bussoni, said La Carconte. He was a foreigner, an Italian from the neighborhood of Mantua, I believe. Let me see this diamond again, replied the jeweller. The first time you are often mistaken as to the value of a stone. Caderousse took from his pocket a small case of black chagrin, opened, and gave it to the jeweller. At the sight of the diamond, which was as large as a hazelnut, La Carconte's eyes sparkled with cupidity. "'And what did you think of this fine story, eavesdropper?' said Monte Cristo. "'Did you credit it?' "'Yes, Your Excellency. I did not look on Caderousse as a bad man, and I thought him incapable of committing a crime, or even a theft. "'That did more honour to your heart than to your experience, Monsieur Bertuccio. Had you known this Edmond Dante of whom they spoke? No, Your Excellency, I had never heard of him before, and never but once afterwards, and that was from the Abbe Busoni himself, when I saw him in the prison at Nîmes. Go on. The jeweller took the ring, and drawing from his pocket a pair of steel pliers, and a small set of copper scales, he took the stone out of its setting, and weighed it carefully. "'I will give you forty-five thousand, said he, "'but not a sou more. "'Besides, as that is the exact value of the stone, "'I brought just that sum with me.' "'Oh, that's no matter,' replied Caderousse. "'I will go back with you to fetch the other five thousand francs.' "'No,' returned the jeweller, "'giving back the diamond and the ring to Caderousse. "'No, it is worth no more.' and I am sorry I offered so much, for the stone has a flaw in it, which I had not seen. However, I will not go back on my word, and I will give forty-five thousand. At least replace the diamond in the ring, said La Carconte sharply. Ah, true, replied the jeweller, and he reset the stone. No matter, observed Caderousse, replacing the box in his pocket. Someone else will purchase it. Yes, continued the jeweller, but someone else will not be so easy as I am, or content himself with the same story. It is not natural that a man like you should possess such a diamond. He will inform against you. You will have to find the Abbe Bussoni, and the Abbe who will give diamonds worth two thousand louis are rare. The law would seize it and put you in prison. If at the end of three or four months you are set at liberty, the ring will be lost, or a false stone worth three francs will be given to you, instead of a diamond worth fifty thousand, or perhaps fifty-five thousand francs, from which you must allow that one runs considerable risk in purchasing. Caderousse and his wife looked eagerly at each other. No, said Caderousse, we are not rich enough to lose five thousand francs. As you please, my dear sir, said the jeweller. I had, however, as you see, brought you the money in bright coin. And he drew from his pocket a handful of gold and held it sparkling before the dazzled eyes of the innkeeper, and in the other hand he held a packet of banknotes. There was evidently a severe struggle in the mind of Caderousse. It was plain that the small chagrin case, which he turned over and over in his hand, did not seem to him commensurate in value to the enormous sum which fascinated his gaze. He turned towards his wife. "'What do you think of this?' he asked in a low voice. "'Let him have it. 
"'Let him have it,' she said. "'If he returns to Beaucaire without the diamond, "'he will inform against us, and, as he says, "'who knows if we shall ever again see the Abbe Boussoni. "'In all probability we shall never see him.' "'Well, then, so I will,' said Caderousse. "'So you may have the diamond for forty-five thousand francs. "'But my wife wants a gold chain, "'and I want a pair of silver buckles.' "'The jeweller drew from his pocket a long flat box, "'which contained several samples of the articles demanded. "'Here,' he said, "'I am very straightforward in my dealings. "'Take your choice.' "'The woman selected a gold chain worth about five louis, "'and the husband a pair of buckles worth perhaps fifteen francs. "'I hope you will not complain now,' said the jeweller. "'The abbe told me it was worth fifty thousand francs,' muttered Caderousse. "'Come, give it to me.' "'What a strange fellow you are,' said the jeweller, taking the diamond from his hand. "'I give you forty-five thousand francs. That is two and a half thousand livres of income, a fortune such as I wish I had myself, and you are not satisfied.' "'And the five and forty thousand francs?' inquired Caderousse in a hoarse voice. "'Where are they? Come, let us see them.' "'Here they are,' replied the jeweller, and he counted out upon the table fifteen thousand francs in gold and thirty thousand francs in banknotes. "'Wait, wait, while I light the lamp,' said La Carconte. "'It is growing dark, and there may be some mistake.' In fact, night had come on during the conversation, and with night the storm which had been threatening for the last half-hour. The thunder growled in the distance, but it was apparently not heard by the jeweller, Caderousse, or La Carconte, absorbed as they were all three with the demon of gain. I myself felt a strange kind of fascination at the sight of all this gold and all these banknotes. It seemed to me that I was in a dream, and as it was always happening in a dream, I felt myself riveted to the spot. Caderousse counted and again counted the gold and the notes, then handed them to his wife, who counted and counted them again in her turn. During this time the jeweller made the diamond play and sparkle in the limelight, and the gem threw out jets of light which made him unmindful of those which, precursors of the storm, began to play in at the windows. "'Well?' inquired the jeweller. "'Is the cash all right?' "'Yes,' said Caderousse. "'Give me the pocket-book, La Carconte, and find a bag somewhere.' La Carconte went to a cupboard, and returned with an old leathern pocket-book and a bag. From the former she took some greasy letters and put in their place the banknotes and from the back took two or three crowns of six livres each, which in all probability formed the entire fortune of the miserable couple. There, said Caderousse, and now, although you have wronged us of perhaps ten thousand francs, will you have your supper with us? I invite you with good will. Thank you, replied the jeweller. It must be getting late, and I must return to Beaucaire. My wife will be getting uneasy. He drew out his watch and exclaimed, "'Morbleu! Nearly nine o'clock! Why, I shall not get back to Beaucaire before midnight. Good night, my friends. If the Abbe Boussonnet should by any accident return, think of me. "'In another week you will have left Beaucaire,' remarked Caderousse, "'for the fair ends in a few days.' "'True, but that makes no difference. Write to me at Paris.' to Monsieur Jouin, in the Palais Royal, Arcade Pierre, numéro 45. I will make the journey on purpose to see him, if it is worth while. At this moment there was a tremendous clap of thunder, accompanied by a flash of lightning so vivid that it quite eclipsed the light of the lamp. "'See here!' exclaimed Caderousse. "'You cannot think of going out in such weather as this.' "'Oh, I am not afraid of thunder,' said the jeweller. "'And then there are robbers,' said La Carconte. "'The road is never very safe during fair time.' "'Oh, as to the robbers,' said Joan, "'here is something for them.' And he drew from his pocket a pair of small pistols, loaded to the muzzle. "'Here,' 
said he, are dogs who bark and bite at the same time. They are for the two first who shall have a longing for your diamond, friend Caderousse. Caderousse and his wife again interchanged a meaning look. It seemed as though they were both inspired at the same time, with some horrible thought. "'Well, then, a good journey to you,' said Caderousse. "'Thanks,' replied the jeweller. He then took his cane, which he had placed against an old cupboard, and went out. At the moment when he opened the door, such a gust of wind came in that the lamp was nearly extinguished. "'Oh,' said he, "'this is a very nice weather, and two leagues to go in such a storm.' "'Remain,' said Caderousse. "'You can sleep here. Yes, do stay.' added la Carconte in a tremulous voice. "'We will take every care of you.' "'No, I must sleep at Beaucaire. So, once more, good night.' Caderousse followed him slowly to the threshold. "'I can see neither heaven nor earth,' said the jeweller, who was outside the door. "'Do I turn to the right or to the left hand?' "'To the right,' said Caderousse. "'You cannot go wrong.' The road is bordered by trees on both sides. Good, all right, said a voice almost lost in the distance. Close the door, said la Carconte. I do not like the open doors when it thunders. Particularly when there is money in the house, eh? answered Caderousse, double locking the door. He came into the room, went to the cupboard, took out the bag and pocket book, and both began for the third time to count their gold and banknotes. I never saw such an expression of cupidity as the flickering lamp revealed in those two countenances. The woman, especially, was hideous. Her usual feverish tremulousness was intensified, her countenance had become livid, and her eyes resembled burning coals. Why, she inquired in a hoarse voice, did you invite him to sleep here to-night? Why, said Caderousse with a shudder, why that he might not have the trouble of returning to beaucaire ah responded the woman with an expression impossible to describe i thought it was for something else woman woman why do you have such ideas cried caderousse or if you have them why don't you keep them to yourself well said la carconte after a moment's pause you are not a man what do you mean added Caderousse. If you had been a man, you would not have let him go from here. Woman! Or else he should not have reached Beaucaire. Woman! The road takes a turn. He is obliged to follow it, while alongside of the canal there is a shorter road. Woman! You offend the good God! There, listen! And at this moment there was a tremendous peal of thunder, while the livid lightning illumined the room, and the thunder, rolling away in the distance, seemed to withdraw unwillingly from the cursed abode. "'Merci!' said Caderousse, crossing himself. At the same moment, and in the midst of the terrifying silence, which usually follows a clap of thunder, they heard a knocking at the door. Caderousse and his wife started and looked aghast at each other. "'Who's there?' cried Caderousse, rising and drawing up in a heap the gold and notes scattered over the table, and which he covered with his two hands. "'It is I,' shouted a voice. "'And who are you?' "'Eh, hey, par Dieu, Joanne, the jeweller.' "'Well, and you said I offended the good God,' said la Carconte, with a hurried smile. "'Why, the good God sends him back again.' Caderousse sank pale and breathless into his chair. La Carconte, on the contrary, rose, and going with a firm step toward the door, opened it, saying as she did so, "'Come in, dear Monsieur Joanne.' "'Ma foi,' said the jeweller, drenched with rain, "'I am not destined to return to Beaucaire to-night. "'The shortest follies are best, my dear Caderousse. "'You offered me hospitality, and I accept it.' and have returned to sleep beneath your friendly roof. Caderousse stammered out something, while he wiped away the sweat that started to his brow. La Carconte double-locked the door behind the jeweller. 
End of chapter 44. Chapter 45 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 45 The Reign of Blood. As the jeweller returned to the apartment, he cast around him a scrutinizing glance, but there was nothing to excite suspicion, if it did not exist, or to confirm it if it were already awakened. Caderousse's hands still grasped the gold and banknotes, and La Carconte called up her sweetest smiles while welcoming the reappearance of their guest. "'Well, well,' said the jeweller, "'you seem, my good friends, to have had some fears respecting the accuracy of your money, by counting it over so carefully directly I was gone.' "'Oh, no,' answered Caderousse, "'that was not my reason. I can assure you, but the circumstance by which we have become possessed of this wealth are so unexpected as to make us scarcely credit our good fortune, and it is only by placing the actual proof of our riches before our eyes that we can persuade ourselves that the whole affair is not a dream. The jeweller smiled. "'Have you any other guests in your house?' inquired he. "'Nobody but ourselves,' replied Caderousse. The fact is, uh, we do not lodge travellers. Indeed, our tavern is so near the town that nobody would think of stopping here. Then I am afraid I shall very much inconvenience you. Inconvenience us? Not at all, my dear sir, said La Carconte, in her most gracious manner. Not at all, I assure you. But where will you manage to stow me? in the chamber overhead. Surely that is where you self sleep. Never mind about that. We have a second bed in the adjoining room. Caderousse stared at his wife with much astonishment. The jeweller, meanwhile, was humming a song as he stood warming his back at the fire La Carconte had kindled to dry the wet garments of her guest, and this done she next occupied herself in arranging his supper by spreading a napkin at the end of the table, and placing on it the slender remains of their dinner, to which she added three or four fresh-laid eggs. Caderousse had once more parted with his treasure. The banknotes were replaced in the pocket-book, the gold put back into the bag, and the whole carefully locked in the cupboard. He then began pacing the room with a pensive and gloomy air, glancing from time to time at the jeweller, who stood reeking with the stream from his wet clothes, and merely changing his place on the warm hearth to enable the whole of his garments to be dried. There, said La Carconte, as she placed a bottle of wine on the table, supper is ready whenever you are. And you? asked Joanne. I don't want any supper, said Caderousse. We dine so very late hastily interposed La Carconte. "'Then it seems I am about to eat alone,' remarked the jeweller. "'Oh, we shall have the pleasure of waiting upon you,' answered La Carconte, with an eager attention. She was not accustomed to manifest, even to guests who paid for what they took. From time to time, Caderousse darted on his wife keen, searching glances, but rapid as the lightning flash. The storm still continued. "'There, there,' said La Carconte. "'Do you hear that? Upon my word, you did well to come back.' "'Nevertheless,' replied the jeweller, "'if by the time I have finished my supper the tempest has at all abated, I shall make another start.' "'It's the Mistral,' said Caderousse, "'and it will be sure to last till tomorrow morning,' he sighed heavily. "'Well,' said the jeweller, as he placed himself at table. "'All I can say is so much the worse for those who are abroad.' "'Yes,' chimed in La Carconte. "'They will have a wretched night of it.' The jeweller began eating his supper, and the woman, 
who was ordinarily so querulous and indifferent to all who approached her, was suddenly transformed into the most smiling and attentive hostess. Had the unhappy man, on whom she lavished her assiduities, been previously acquainted with her, so sudden an alteration might well have excited suspicion in his mind, or at least have greatly astonished him. Caderousse, meanwhile, continued to pace the room in gloomy silence, sedulously avoiding the sight of his guest, but as soon as the stranger had completed his repast, the agitated innkeeper went eagerly to the door and opened it. "'I believe the storm is over,' said he. But as if to contradict his statement, at that instant a violent clap of thunder seemed to shake the house to the very foundation, while a sudden gust of wind, mingled with rain, extinguished the lamp he held in his hand. Trembling and awestruck, Caderousse hastily shut the door and returned to his guest, while La Carconte lighted a candle by the smouldering ashes that glimmered on the hearth. "'You must be tired,' said she to the jeweller. "'I have spread a pair of white sheets on your bed. Go up when you are ready, and sleep well.' Joan stayed for a while to see whether the storm seemed to abate in its fury, but a brief space of time sufficed to assure him that, instead of diminishing, the violence of the rain and thunder momentarily increased. Resigning himself, therefore, to what seemed inevitable, he bade his host good night and mounted the stairs. He passed over my head, and I heard the flooring creak beneath his footsteps. The quick, eager glance of La Carconte followed him as he ascended, while Caderousse, on the contrary, turned his back and seemed most anxiously to avoid even glancing at him. All these circumstances did not strike me as painfully at the time as they have since done. In fact, all that had happened, with the exception of the story of the diamond which certainly did wear an air of improbability, appeared natural enough and called for neither apprehension nor mistrust. But, worn out as I was with fatigue and fully purposing to proceed onwards, directly the tempest abated, I determined to obtain a few hours' sleep. Overhead I could accurately distinguish every movement of the jeweller, who, after making the best arrangements in his power for passing a comfortable night, threw himself on his bed, and I could hear it creak and groan beneath his weight. Insensibly my eyelids grew heavy, deep sleep stole over me, and having no suspicion of anything wrong, I sought not to shake it off. I looked into the kitchen once more, and saw Caderousse sitting by the side of a long table upon one of the low wooden stools, which in country places are frequently used instead of chairs. His back was turned towards me, so that I could not see the expression of his countenance. Neither should I have been able to do so, had he been placed differently, as his head was buried between his two hands. La Carconte continued to gaze on him for some time, then shrugging her shoulders, she took her seat immediately opposite to him. At this moment the expiring embers threw up a fresh flame from the kindling of a piece of wood that lay near, and a bright light flashed over the room. La Carconte still kept her eyes fixed on her husband, but as he made no sign of changing his position, she extended her hard, bony hand and touched him on the forehead. Caderousse shuddered. The woman's lips seemed to move, as though she were talking. But because she merely spoke in an undertone, or my senses were dulled by sleep, I did not catch a word she uttered. Confused sights and sounds seemed to float before me, and gradually I fell into a deep, heavy slumber. How long I had been in this unconscious state I know not, when I was suddenly aroused by the report of a pistol, followed by a fearful cry. Weak and tottering footsteps resounded across the chamber above me, and the next instant a dull, heavy weight seemed to fall powerless on the staircase. I had not yet fully recovered consciousness, when again I heard groans, mingled with half-stifled cries, 
as if from persons engaged in a deadly struggle a cry more prolonged than the others and ending in a series of groans effectually roused me from my drowsy lethargy hastily raising myself in one arm i looked around but all was dark and it seemed to me as if the rain must have penetrated through the flooring of the room above for some kind of moisture appeared to fall drop by drop upon my forehead and when i passed my hand across my brow i felt that it was wet and clammy to the fearful noises that had awakened me had succeeded the most perfect silence unbroken save by the footsteps of a man walking about in the chamber above the staircase creaked he descended into the room below approached the fire and lit a candle the man was Caderousse. he was pale and his shirt was all bloody having obtained the light he hurried upstairs again and once more i heard his rapid and uneasy footsteps a moment later he came down again holding in his hand the small chagrin case which he opened to assure himself it contained the diamond seemed to hesitate as to which pocket he should put it in then as if dissatisfied with the security of either pocket he deposited it in his red handkerchief which he carefully rolled around his head after this he took from the cupboard the banknotes and gold he had put there thrust the one into the pocket of his trousers and the other into that of his waistcoat hastily tied up a small bundle of linen and rushing towards the door disappeared in the darkness of the night then all became clear and manifest to me and i reproached myself with what had happened as though i myself had done the guilty deed i fancied that i still heard faint moans and imagining that the unfortunate jeweller might not be quite dead i determined to go to his relief by way of atoning in some slight degree not for the crime i had committed but for that which i had not endeavoured to prevent for this purpose i applied all the strength i possessed to force an entrance from the cramped spot in which i lay to the adjoining room the poorly fastened boards which alone divided me from it yielded to my efforts and i found myself in the house hastily snatching up the lighted candle i hurried to the staircase about midway a body was lying quite across the stairs it was that of la carconte the pistol i had heard had doubtless been fired at her the shot had frightfully lacerated her throat leaving two gaping wounds from which as well as the mouth the blood was pouring in floods she was stone dead i strode past her and ascended to the sleeping chamber which presented an appearance of the wildest disorder the furniture had been knocked over in the deadly struggle that had taken place there and the sheets to which the unfortunate jeweller had doubtless clung were dragged across the room the murdered man lay on the floor his head leaning against the wall and about him was a pool of blood which poured forth from three large wounds in his breast there was a fourth gash in which a long table knife was plunged up to the handle i stumbled over some object i stooped to examine it was the second pistol which had not gone off probably from the powder being wet i approached the jeweller who was not quite dead and at the sound of my footsteps and the creaking of the floor he opened his eyes fixed them on me with an anxious and inquiring gaze moved his lips as though trying to speak then overcome by the effort fell back and expired this appalling sight almost bereft me of my senses and finding that i could no longer be of service to any one in the house my only desire was to fly i rushed towards the staircase clutching my hair and uttering a groan of horror upon reaching the room below i found five or six custom house officers and two or three gendarmes all heavily armed they threw themselves upon me 
I made no resistance. I was no longer master of my senses. When I strove to speak, a few inarticulate sounds alone escaped my lips. As I noticed the significant manner in which the whole party pointed to my blood-stained garments, I involuntarily surveyed myself, and then I discovered that the thick warm drops that had so bedewed me as I lay beneath the staircase must have been the blood of La Carconte. I pointed to the spot where I had concealed myself. "'What does he mean?' asked a gendarme. One of the officers went to the place I directed. "'He means,' replied the man, upon his return, "'that he got in that way, and he showed me the hole I had made when I broke through. Then I saw that they took me for the assassin. I recovered force and energy enough to free myself from the hands of those who held me, while I managed to stammer forth. "'I did not do it. Indeed, indeed, I did not.' A couple of gendarmes held the muzzles of their carbines against my breast. "'Stir but a step,' said they, "'and you are a dead man.' "'Why should you threaten me with death?' cried I, "'when I have already declared my innocence.' "'Tush, tush!' cried the men. "'Keep your innocent stories to tell the judge at Nîmes. "'Meanwhile, come along with us, "'and the best advice we can give you to do is unresistingly.' Alas, resistance was far from my thoughts. I was utterly overpowered by surprise and terror, and without a word I suffered myself to be handcuffed and tied to a horse's tail, and thus they took me to Nîmes. I had been tracked by our customs officer, who had lost sight of me near the tavern. Feeling certain that I intended to pass the night there, he had returned to summon his comrades, who just arrived in time to hear the report of the pistol, and to take me in the midst of such circumstantial proofs of my guilt as rendered all hopes of proving my innocence utterly futile. One only chance was left me, that of beseeching the magistrate, before whom I was taken to cause every inquiry to be made for the Abbe Busoni, who had stopped at the inn of the Pont du Garde on that morning. If Caderousse had invented the story relative to the diamond, and there existed no such persons as the Abbe Busoni, then, indeed, I was lost past redemption, or, at least, my life hung upon the feeble chance of Caderousse himself being apprehended and confessing the whole truth. Two months have passed away in hopeless expectation on my part, while I must do the magistrate the justice to say that he used every means to obtain information of the person I declared could exculpate me if he would. Caderousse still evaded all pursuit, and I had resigned myself to what seemed my inevitable fate. My trial was to come on at the approaching assizes, when, on the 8th of September, that is to say, precisely three months and five days after the events which had periled my life, the Abbe Busoni, whom I never ventured to believe I should see, presented himself at the prison doors, saying he understood one of the prisoners wished to speak to him. He added that, having learned at Marseilles the particulars of my imprisonment, he hastened to comply with my desire. You may easily imagine with what eagerness I welcomed him, and how minutely I related the whole of what I had seen and heard. I felt some degree of nervousness as I entered upon the history of the diamond, but to my inexpressible astonishment he confirmed it in every particular, and to my equal surprise he seemed to place entire belief in all I said. And then it was that, won by his mild charity, seeing that he was acquainted with all the habits and customs of my own country, and considering also that pardon for the only crime of which I was really guilty might come with a double power from lips so benevolent and kind, I besought him to receive my confession, under the seal of which I recounted the Auteuil affair in all its details, as well as every other transaction of my life. That which I had done 
by the impulse of my best feelings produced the same effect as though it had been the result of calculation my voluntary confession of the assassination at Auteuil proved to him that i had not committed that of which i stood accused when he quitted me he bade me be of good courage and to rely upon his doing all in his power to convince my judges of my innocence i had speedy proofs that the excellent abbe was engaged in my behalf for the rigours of my imprisonment were alleviated by many trifling though acceptable indulgences and i was told that my trial was to be postponed to the assizes following those now being held in the interests it pleased providence to cause the apprehension of caderousse who was discovered in some distant country and brought back to france where he made a full confession refusing to make the fact of his wife's having suggested and arranged the murder any excuse for his own guilt the wretched man was sentenced to the galleys for life and i was immediately set at liberty and then it was i presume said monte cristo that you came to me as the bearer of a letter from the abbe busoni it was your excellency the benevolent abbe took an evident interest in all that concerned me your mode of life as a smuggler said he to me one day will be the ruin of you if you get out don't take it up again but how inquired i am i to maintain myself and my poor sister a person whose confessor i am replied he and who entertains a high regard for me applied to me a short time since to procure him a confidential servant would you like such a post if so i will give you a letter of introduction to him oh father i exclaimed you are very good but you must swear solemnly that i shall never have reason to repent of my recommendation i extended my hand and was about to pledge myself by any promise he would dictate but he stopped me it is unnecessary for you to bind yourself by any vow said he i know and admire the corsican nature too well to fear you here take this continued he after rapidly writing the few lines i brought them to your excellency and upon receipt of which you deigned to receive me into your service and proudly i ask whether your excellency has ever had cause to repent having done so no replied the count i take pleasure in saying that you have served me faithfully bertuccio but you might have shown more confidence in me i your excellency yes you how comes it that having both a sister and an adopted son you have never spoken to me of either alas i have still to recount the most distressing period of my life anxious as you may suppose i was to behold and comfort my dear sister i lost no time in hastening to corsica but when i arrived at rogliano i found a house of mourning the consequences of a scene so horrible that the neighbors remember and speak of it to this day acting by my advice my poor sister had refused to comply with the unreasonable demands of benedetto who was continually tormenting her for money as long as he believed there was a sou left in her possession one morning that he demanded money threatening her with the severest consequences if she did not supply him with what he desired he disappeared and remained away all day leaving the kind-hearted assunta who loved him as if he were her own child to weep over his conduct and bewail his absence evening came and still with all the patient solicitude of a mother she watched for his return as the eleventh hour struck he entered with a swaggering air attended by two of the most dissolute and reckless of his boon companions she stretched out her arms to him but they seized hold of her 
and one of the three none other than the accursed benedetto exclaimed put her to torture and she'll soon tell us where her money is it unfortunately happened that our neighbor vasilio was at bastilla leaving no person in his house but his wife no human creature beside could bear or see anything that took place within our dwelling two held poor assunta who unable to conceive that any harm was intended to her smiled in the face of those who were soon to become her executioners the third proceeded to barricade the doors and windows then returned and the three united in stifling the cries of terror incited by the sight of these preparations and then dragged assunta feet foremost towards the brazier expecting to wring from her an avowal of where her supposed treasure was secreted in the struggle her clothes caught fire and they were obliged to let go their hold in order to preserve themselves from sharing the same fate covered with flames assunta rushed wildly to the door but it was fastened she flew to the windows but they were also secured then the neighbors heard frightful shrieks it was assunta calling for help the cries died away in groans and the next morning as soon as vasilio's wife could muster up courage to venture abroad she caused the door of our dwelling to be opened by the public authorities when assunta although dreadfully burnt was found still breathing every drawer and closet in the house had been forced open and the money stolen benedetto never again appeared at rogliano neither have i since that day either seen or heard anything concerning him it was subsequently to these dreadful events that i waited on your excellency to whom it would have been folly to have mentioned benedetto since all trace of him seemed entirely lost or of my sister since she was dead and in what light did you view the occurrence inquired monte cristo as a punishment for the crime i had committed answered bertuccio oh those villefort are an accursed race truly they are murmured the count in a lugubrious tone and now resumed bertuccio your excellency may perhaps be able to comprehend that this place which i revisit for the first time this garden the actual scene of my crime must have given rise to reflection of no very agreeable nature and produced that gloom and depression of spirits which excited the notice of your excellency who was pleased to express a desire to know the cause at this instant a shudder passes over me as i reflect that possibly i am now standing on the very grave in which lies monsieur de villefort by whose hand the ground was dug to receive the corpse of his child everything is possible said monte cristo rising from the bench on which he had been sitting even he added in an inaudible voice even that the procureur be not dead the abbe busoni did right to send you to me he went on in his ordinary tone and you have done well in relating to me the whole of your history as it will prevent my forming any erroneous opinions concerning you in future as for that benedetto who so grossly belied his name have you never made any effort to trace out whether he has gone or what has become of him no far from wishing to learn whither he has betaken himself i should shun the possibility of meeting him as i would a wild beast thank god i never have heard his name mentioned by any person and i hope and believe he is dead do not think so bertuccio replied the count for the wicked are not so easily disposed of for god seems to have them under his special watch care to make of them instruments of his vengeance so be it responded bertuccio all i ask of heaven is that i may never see him again and now your excellency he added bowing his head you know everything you are my judge on earth as the almighty is in heaven have you for me no words of consolation 
my good friend i can only repeat the words addressed to you by the abbe busoni villefort merited punishment for what he had done to you and perhaps to others benedetto if still living will become the instrument of divine retribution in some way or other and then be duly punished in his turn as far as yourself are concerned i see but one point in which you are really guilty ask yourself wherefore after rescuing the infant from its living grave you did not restore it to its mother there was the crime bertuccio that was where you became really culpable true excellency that was the crime the real crime for in that i acted like a coward my first duty directly i had succeeded in recalling the babe to life was to restore it to its mother but in order to do so i must have made close and careful inquiry which would in all probability have led to my own apprehension and i clung to life partly on my sister's account and partly for the feeling of pride inborn in our hearts of desiring to come off untouched and victorious in the execution of our vengeance perhaps too the natural and instinctive love of life made me wish to avoid endangering my own and then again i am not as brave and courageous as was my poor brother bertuccio hid his face in his hands as he uttered these words while monte cristo fixed on him a look of inscrutable meaning after a brief silence rendered still more solemn by the time and place the count said in a tone of melancholy wholly unlike his usual manner in order to bring this conversation to a fitting termination the last we shall ever hold upon this subject i will repeat to you some words i have heard from the lips of the abbe busoni for all evils there are two remedies time and silence and now leave me monsieur bertuccio to walk alone here in the garden the very circumstances which inflict on you as a principle in the tragic scene enacted here such painful emotions are to me on the contrary a source of something like contentment and serve but to enhance the value of this dwelling in my estimation the chief beauty of trees consists in the deep shadow of their umbrageous boughs while fancy pictures a moving multitude of shapes and forms flitting and passing beneath that shade here i have a garden laid out in such a way as to afford the fullest scope for the imagination and furnished with thickly grown trees beneath whose leafy screen a visionary like myself may conjure up phantoms at will this to me who expected but to find a blank enclosure surrounded by a straight wall is i assure you a most agreeable surprise i have no fear of ghosts and i have never heard it said that so much harm had been done by the dead during six thousand years as is wrought by the living in a single day retire within bertuccio and tranquilize your mind should your confessor be less indulgent to you in your dying moments than you found the abbe busoni send for me if i am still on earth and i will soothe your ears with words that will effectually calm and soothe your parting soul ere it goes forth to traverse the ocean called eternity bertuccio bowed respectfully and turned away sighing heavily monte cristo left alone took three or four steps onwards and murmured here beneath this plane tree must have been where the infant's grave was dug there is a little door opening into the garden at this corner is the private staircase communicating with the sleeping apartment there will be no necessity for me to make a note of these particulars for there before my eyes beneath my feet all around me i have the plan sketched with all the living reality of truth after making the tour of the garden a second time the count re-entered his carriage while bertuccio 
who perceived the thoughtful expression of his master's features, took his seat beside the driver without uttering a word. The carriage proceeded rapidly towards Paris. That same evening, upon reaching his abode in the Champs-Élysées, the Count of Monte Cristo went over the whole building with the air of one long acquainted with each nook or corner. Nor, although preceding the party, did he once mistake one door for another, or commit the smallest error when choosing any particular corridor or staircase to conduct him to a place or suite of rooms he desired to visit. Ali was his principal attendant during this nocturnal survey, having given various orders to Bertuccio relative to the improvements and alterations he decided to make in the house, the Count, drawing out his watch, said to the attentive Nubian, "'It is half-past eleven o'clock. Heidi will soon be here. Have the French attendants been summoned to await her calming?' Ali extended his hands towards the apartments destined for the fair Greek, which were so effectually concealed by means of a tapestried entrance that it would have puzzled the most curious to have divined their existence. Ali, having pointed to the apartments, held up three fingers of his right hand, and then, placing it beneath his head, shut his eyes and feigned to sleep. "'I understand,' said Monte Cristo, well acquainted with Ali's pantomime. "'You mean to tell me that three female attendants await their new mistress in her sleeping chamber?' Ali, with considerable animation, made a sign in the affirmative. "'Madame will be tired to-night,' continued Monte Cristo, "'and will, no doubt, wish to rest. Desire the French attendants not to weary her with questions, but merely to pay their respectful duty and retire. You will also see that the Greek servants hold no communication with those of this country.' He bowed, just at that moment voices were heard, hailing the concierge. The gate opened, a carriage rolled down the avenue and stopped at the steps. The Count hastily descended, presented himself at the already opened carriage door, and held out his hand to a young woman, completely enveloped in a green silk mantle, heavily embroidered with gold. She raised the hand extended toward her to her lips, and kissed it with a mixture of love and respect. Some few words passed between them, in that sonorous language in which Homer makes his gods converse. The young woman spoke with an expression of deep tenderness, while the Count replied with an air of gentle gravity. Preceded by Ali, who carried a rose-coloured flambeau in his hand, the newcomer, who was no other than the lovely Greek who had been Monte Cristo's companion in Italy, was conducted to her apartments, while the Count retired to the pavilion reserved for himself. In another hour every light in the house was extinguished, and it might have been thought that all its inmates slept. End of chapter 45